Uh, my name's Derek Medina, and I'm a board member with the Clallam Jefferson County Pro Bono Lawyers. And on behalf of Pro Bono, thank you for coming out and attending tonight's presentation entitled Protecting Legal Rights, Immigration Law in an Age of Uncertainty. I'd like to thank uh, Noah Purcell, Washington Solicitor General, Jorge Barron, and Ann Benson for joining us in Port Angeles to give this presentation. Thank you. I'd also like to th thank our executive director, uh, Shauna Rogers. I'd like to thank uh, the members of the board for pro bono lawyers. And, I'll and I'd also like to thank uh, Peninsula College uh, for hosting this event. And I'd really like to thank everybody who's come here and purchased a ticket. Um, you are supporting access to justice, uh, pro bono lawyers. And I would like to briefly explain what the Clallam Jefferson County Pro Bono Lawyers does. Uh, we provide the general public with free access to a civil attorney. And uh, believe it or not, this is essential for justice to occur. And it is also very rarely achieved. I'll give some statistics here. 86% of civil legal problems reported by low-income Americans receive inadequate or no legal help. 71% of these low-income Americans experience at least one civil legal problem. This includes domestic violence, access to veterans' benefits, disability access, housing, and healthcare issues. And unfortunately, low income Americans, they seek professional help only in 20% of these legal problems. You hear a lot about criminal issues and we have public defenders to do that, but civil legal aid is lacking. The need is there and there are a lack of access to attorneys and that's where the pro bono lawyers come into play. Uh, Clallam, Clallam County pro bono lawyers have helped 906 clients in 2016. Th helped them in family law issues, housing issues, consumer issues. We also have locally quarterly clinics where the community can get free legal advice from attorneys. Uh, in the last year, we've had uh, three advanced directive clinics, basically um, helping out with uh, estate planning issues. We've had four wills clinics. We've had uh, a medical clinic. We've actually had one Spanish outreach clinic. And we've served clients in a number of various areas. And this is where people can come, talk to attorneys, and get some legal advice. We also have a family court facilitator. And Kathy, our uh, family court uh, facilitator, has uh, helped 370 local community members complete forms in uh, dissolution of marriage, establishing parenting plans, restraining orders, and a number of other legal situations where otherwise people don't have the ability to pay for attorneys. So uh, this is what pro bono lawyers does. Uh, and I thank you for coming out here and fundraising, paying your ticket to help out folks in your community who are otherwise unable to access ju justice. Uh, even though we do this, we still don't have enough resources to meet the needs of our community. And with your help, we hope to have more direct representation and helping people with civil legal aid. So. Thank you for coming out here and doing this. Please call your local leaders. Uh, thank you. As an attorney in this community, please call your local leaders to help fund this. Um, 
I charge $250 an hour to do something. Most people can't afford that. We need some help, and we have systematic and governmental agencies who can help. Okay, enough of that. That's what Pro Bono does. Thank you for doing this. Now we're going to get to our main topic. And the USA has traditionally embraced immigrants and recognized their inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have tourist visas, lawful permanent residents. We have special immigrant juvenile status. And our country has been open to non-citizens for a long time. It's in our American values to think thoughtfully and soberly for the justifications to barring people from entering this country. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're as excited as I am to hear Mr. Purcell, Mr. Barone, uh, to discuss this issue. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Miss Kathy Marshall, the field office attorney general, and she'll talk a little bit about our Washington attorney general. Kathy, come on up here. Thank you, Derek. Tonight, I am honored to introduce you to a legal rock star. <laughs> Noah Purcell was thrust into the national spotlight this past February when he successfully argued Washington versus Trump. Before first the U.S. District Court Judge Jason Robart and then a few days later at the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit where an unprecedented number of people, it's been reported, I was asking Noah if he knew how many people had actually listened to the live stream, but when, when you take into account the TV and everything, figures probably, well, figure I heard is over half a million people listened in as it was streamed live. So as the Solicitor General for the state of Washington, Noah, along with Attorney General Bob uh, Ferguson, he played a major role in stopping Donald Trump's executive order banning travel for people from seven Muslim majority countries. Originally from the Beacon Hill area in Seattle, Noah went to Franklin High School and then to the University of Washington. He was actively engaged in social justice causes and at the University of Washington received a Mary Gates Leadership Award for his work founding and running Affordable Tuition Now, a student advocacy group dedicated to keeping college tuition affordable. After graduating from the University of Washington, Noah went on to Harvard Law School, where he graduated magna cum laude and served as editor of the prestigious Harvard Law Review. So Noah's no slouch. <laughs> Following law school, Noah served as a law clerk to U.S. Court of Appeals Judge David Tatel of the D.C. Circuit, and then as clerk to former U.S. Supreme Court Justice David Souter. In 2013, after Noah had worked for Homeland Security's Office of General Counsel and for Perkins Coie, a prominent Seattle law firm, Bob Ferguson appointed him as Solicitor General for the state of Washington. In this role, Noah wears many hats, including representing the state in litigation involving the powers of initiative and referendum, counsel to the Secretary of State, counsel to the Lieutenant Governor, and counsel to the Administrative Office of the Courts. He also serves as chair of the Ethics Committee for the Attorney General's Office and plays a role in coordinating legal advice on issues of statewide and now national significance. Noah is married to his high school sweetheart, Jasmine Weaver, a rock star in her own right, and they have two adorable children. I've seen pictures. Please give a warm welcome to the man who has been called the de facto defender of the Constitution, Washington State Solicitor General, Noah Purcell. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Kathy, for that way too, uh, way too generous introduction. Uh, but before I, I'm going to talk mostly tonight about our state's case challenging the travel ban executive order. But before I get to that, there's there's just two quick things I want to say. Um, first, although uh, the travel ban case, of course, was in the news a lot, our office is actually 
you know, that's not what we typically do, right? That's not a typical case in many ways. And what we typically do most of the time is, is uh, represent uh, state agencies and uh, the public interest in cases uh, small and large throughout the state. And Kathy and our team here in the Port Angeles office of the AG's office are an integral part of that. And I just want to recognize her and thank them for their work uh, for out here on behalf of the public. So. Um, and, and then the other preliminary thing I want to say uh, along the lines of, of uh, the very first uh, speaker is that, you know, most, when most people need legal help, what they need legal help with is not challenging uh, an executive order, right? When most people need legal help, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's because they can't afford a lawyer for their divorce proceeding or, or they have a dispute with their landlord or, you know, disability benefits or something like that. And, and those, um, those cases are almost never in the news, right? They rarely get attention. But they can affect people's lives in every bit of a dramatic a way as, as an executive order, right? I mean, getting a domestic violence protection order can truly change someone's life. And, uh, and that work uh, is what you're all here to support tonight. So I want to thank you for coming out on a sunny Friday, Friday evening to, uh, to support that and, uh, and to hear me uh, talk. So with that, uh, so thank you. All, so I just want to thank you uh, to the Pro Bono uh, Legal Services Board here in Clallam and Jefferson Counties for, for their work. Uh, with that, I will I will start my uh, my presentation here, and uh, let's see here. So, uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so so first, just a little bit about executive orders. Um, there's actually nothing in the Constitution about executive orders, but they've been done. Uh, for a long, long time by presidents throughout history, and presidents just sort of have assumed they have this power. And uh, uh, President Obama got criticized a fair amount for, uh, by some, for sort of abusing uh, executive power. Uh, but really, by historical standards, his uh, use of executive orders was, was pretty typical, uh, just so folks sort of can see some of the history about this. Uh, Washington has a sad history, really, with our relation to executive orders. The, the probably most famous executive order before uh, the travel ban ones uh, was Executive Order 9066 that, uh, during World War II, authorized the internment and incarceration of, of Japanese Americans. And uh, Washington actually has sort of a sad history in relation to that executive order. Our state, at the time, uh, state elected officials pretty vocally supported that executive order. And uh, when there was a case challenging that order that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, the Korematsu case, uh, the states of Washington, Oregon, and California jointly submitted an amicus brief to the Supreme Court in support of the constitutionality of that order. So uh, we have not always uh, lived up to our highest ideals in the past when it comes to uh, executive orders and, um, and minority groups. And so that was just something... Uh, informing our thinking at least a little bit in the Attorney General's office as we thought about our role and what our responsibilities are. So uh, fast forward to uh, the presidential campaign and let's see if this audio works here. I'm going to try to play this clip. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on? So that was what the president said during the campaign, and that, was, that statement remained on his website until about two months ago. And, uh, and that s statement became basically exhibit A, B, C, D, and E of our, of our, uh, of our case, uh, challenging uh, the executive order. It's, it's pretty stark, uh, that statement. Donald? Uh, sorry. Uh, so... So that's what he said during the campaign, and he, he, he repeated variations on that statement many, many times, even when given the opportunity to kind of clarify or narrow or distance himself from it. And then he took office, and seven days later signed uh, Executive Order 13769, the, the first travel ban executive order. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about what was in it. So uh, suspended entry into the U.S. from nationals of seven countries, and... Uh, it it's almost feels like a lifetime since, since this all happened, but it's important to remember that the original one, uh, it applied regardless of, uh, it, it applied to you if you were from one of these countries, even if you had been living in this country legally for many years. So, for example, uh, if you were a green card holder uh, originally from Iran and had lived in 
um, had lived in Washington State for 20 years uh, legally, you, and you happened to be overseas at the time the executive order was issued, you could not come back in. And there were a fair number of people who found themselves in that bizarre circumstance. Uh, there were professors at the University of Washington and Washington State University who happened to be overseas at the time the order was, was entered. There were employees of some uh, larger companies in the Puget Sound area that happened to be overseas. There were people who just you know, had gone to Vancouver for the weekend and, and all of a sudden couldn't get back into the country. So, um, so it was just a shocking uh, sort of rebuke to people who had been living here lawfully for many years. Uh, suspended the U.S. refugee program, uh, basically said that in the refugee admission process, people would be prioritized based on religious persecution, but only if they were a religious minority in their country of origin, which the president made pretty clear on TV, uh, in his mind meant uh, Christians from majority Muslim countries, and then suspended entry of Syrian refugees indefinitely. Uh, so that was late on a Friday afternoon that that was issued, uh, and it was pretty amazing, the response. So first of all, uh, attorneys, um, and Jorge will probably talk about this some more because I know some of his team uh, did this and helped with this, but so many attorneys just immediately started looking for what they could do to help. And, and in many cases, that was going to the airport and trying to find individual clients uh, to represent. And you can see how many, you know, that's a picture from SeaTac Airport. Uh, thousands of people went to airports all over the country uh, to protest, uh, which was very heartening to see. Uh, at the Attorney General's office, we don't, we can't technically represent individuals, uh, so we couldn't really help any sort of particular individual with their situation, but what we can do is represent the state. And so that uh, Saturday, while thousands of people were gathering at the airport and other attorneys were doing all sorts of other things to help, uh, the Attorney General and I had a, had a long conversation about the possibility of challenging the executive order and what our arguments could be, what the hurdles would be, and he pretty quickly decided that we would, we would bring this case and that we were going to move very quickly because uh, you know, the order was issued on Friday afternoon. It took effect immediately. There were literally people being put on planes and sent back to where they had traveled from or, or prevented from getting on planes at all. Uh, and in some cases, those people had, you know, just left a refugee camp, had spent their entire life savings to, um, to, to make the trip. And so there were, there were people being harmed every second. And, and also people who were uh, not, not just people in those circumstances, but also, for example, the, there was a dean at the University of Washington School of Nursing who was supposed to go give the keynote address at a conference in Hong Kong uh, who was going to be prevented by the travel ban from going. And that was just sort of a very interesting example that came up very quickly of how ridiculous, I thought, uh, many aspects of the travel ban were. I mean, what possible national security reason could there be to ban a dean of nursing at the UW from going to speak at a conference and then come back to the country who's been, you know, someone who's been living, living there here for many years. Um, anyway, I won't go on about that much longer. But, um, but so that's, uh, that was Saturday. And then later that day, uh, Giuliani went on TV and said this, which became exhibit F through H of our, uh, of our, uh, of our uh, case. And um, so, so, uh, so Saturday was when we decided to file the case. Uh, Monday, by Monday we had everything done, and, and for the lawyers in the room, I shouldn't say we had everything done. We had enough done to file. Uh, we, had, we had gathered declarations from state agencies that were affected. We had uh, gotten declarations from some uh, big companies uh, who had employees affected, like Expedia and Amazon. Uh, we had written our motion for a temporary restraining order and our complaint, and uh, and so here, so this is just a quick summary of sort of our main arguments that we had. We had a, a First Amendment claim, an equal protection claim, a due process claim. And then we also had an argument that the order violated the Immigration and Nationality Act. Any of you who've ever dealt with that act know that it's basically incomprehensible, even to people who have dealt with it for years. Um, Jorge can probably confirm that. Um, and anyway, I won't go on about that. But those were our basic claims. And... Uh, so we filed on Monday, and on the judge very quickly, uh, Judge Robart, uh, who was the judge assigned, uh, George W. Bush appointee, been on the bench I think since 2004 or so, uh, he immediately asked us for a supplemental brief on why the state had standing to bring this case, meaning we, how the state was harmed. And I wanted to just put this slide in here, being at Peninsula College, I thought it would be useful to point out that the, one of the main ways that we were able to show standing and harm to the state was actually through the effect on the state's uh, colleges and universities. We had declarations from uh, the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges, from uh, Jeffrey Reitinger, who's a, a dean at UW, 
uh, we had a declaration from a dean at WSU uh, about the number of students and faculty who either were stranded overseas by the order or who were not gonna be able to come either to research or work or teach or attend at, uh, at, the, at the colleges and universities. So I just thought, given where we are, uh, that was really the, the, what ultimately ended up uh, establishing standing for the state in this case. So we had to file this by Wednesday at noon. So uh, we had to, yeah, so, so that first weekend is a bit of a blur. There was a lot of coffee, not very much sleeping. Then we had to file this by Wednesday at noon, and then uh, the judge set the federal government's response deadline Thursday at midnight, uh, and then the hearing was Friday at 2.30. So there was basically 14 hours between when the federal government had to first file any papers and the hearing at least some of which theoretically should have been spent sleeping. Um, but, uh, and uh, one funny, this is just a funny anecdote, uh, you know, with a temporary restraining order, you actually have to file it in, in person, and, uh, and uh, traffic in Seattle on a Friday afternoon is not the best, you know. So uh, our, our office in Seattle is not that far from the courthouse, but it's far enough that we, we ended up having to run. And the only part of this that's not really true is that I did not lead the race because, um, <laughs> Two other people on our team uh, were much faster. Uh, <laughs> Marcia, Marcia and Patricio are both faster, for the record. So, so um, I learned that uh, during the course of that run. Anyway, so so we filed. Anyway, so so then Friday afternoon is the hearing at 2:30, and uh, like I said, 14 hours from when the federal government filed their response, and uh, it was really an incredible team effort to this whole case, but but especially things like preparing for that hearing. I mean, we had. Uh, as you saw, we had a number of claims in our complaint and motion for temporary restraining order. Those are not all things that I was particularly familiar with before we filed this case. Some of them I had done cases about before, but others, uh, I still don't really understand the Immigration and Nationality Act, to be perfectly honest. Um, and, and people on our team stayed up all night working on, you know, here's what they're arguing, here are the best answers that you should give if they come up. And the hearing was Friday afternoon, and uh, certainly, I would have liked to have had more time to prepare, but, but I felt much more prepared than I would have because of all the work of other folks in our office, and also other folks at places like Northwest Immigrant Rights Project that Jorge will talk about, and, um, and an incredible outpouring of support, really, from lawyers across the country. I mean, we got unsolicited help and advice, some of it actually quite helpful, uh, from lawyers all over the country, uh, including you know professors, uh, immigration law practitioners, and uh, it, was, it was an incredible outpouring of support. So the hearings in front of Judge Robart, the hearing itself was quite a scene. Uh, the line to get into the courtroom uh, sort of snaked all the way around the floor and then, and then backed up so that they eventually had to have multiple overflow rooms. And the only people really in the courtroom were uh, the lawyers on the case, a lot of reporters, some other federal judges, and, uh, and my mom, uh, who, 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 was, who was the first person in line uh, to get in. Uh, and I think actually sat through part of a trial that Judge Robert had been overseeing before, uh, before this uh, to, be, to be in there. So, uh, and Judge Robart, uh, I, you know, it's available online if anyone wants to go watch. Uh, it was quite a hearing. He asked very pointed questions of both sides and really didn't tip his hand, at least as far as I could tell, which way he was going to rule during the course of the hearing. So, you know, uh, when it got to the end and he started to, he said that he was going to read his ruling from the bench, you know, I truly had no idea which way it was going to come out. And even partway through the ruling, as he got into it, the first several minutes were sort of the preliminary stuff about the standard for a preliminary injunction and the proper role of courts and the, you know, three branches of government. And um, at, at some point, I thought he was just messing with us. I thought he was just trying to give me a heart attack because I think I had three heart attacks during the course of that. Uh, and then finally... Um, this TRO is granted on a nationwide basis and prohibits enforcement of sections 3C, 5A, 5B, 5C, and 5E of the executive order. He said that, yes. Uh, and honestly, uh, we hadn't had much time to think about what would happen if we won, <laughs> you know? Um, and it was, that was an incredibly powerful moment for me and, and our whole team, uh, just to think about you know, the, the impact that this would have on people's lives. And so there were definitely, uh, definitely some tears. And um, there was also a little bit of media interest, uh, <laughs> just a little bit. Um, our press secretary, uh, you can see, let's see. So that's, uh, so in the middle there, obviously, the attorney general, me, uh, our, our head of our wing, Luke Civil Rights Unit, Colleen Melody, right there. 
uh, Patricio and Marcia, who are both faster than me, and then, uh, and then our press secretary. And, um, and he was joking that basically we could have been on TV uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the time after that. But of course, there wasn't time to do that um, uh, because uh, the case wasn't over, not even close to over. Uh, the good news was there were immediate impacts. People started to have their visas reinstated. People were able to travel. There were some pretty incredible scenes at airports that next day, that Saturday, with people who had been turned away at first being able to come in, reunite with their families, and, uh, and, and just some pretty incredible uh, scenes. Uh, we also got an incredible number of letters and emails and phone calls from people around the state and around the world, really. And I just want to read two of them because I think they give you a sense of sort of what impact the case had pretty quickly. Um, so if you'll bear with me for a minute. Uh, so first, dear Noah, just wanted to thank you and express my appreciation for your accomplishment. You probably don't remember me, but I was an English language learner teacher at Kimball Elementary when you attended. <laughs> yeah, this came to my parents' house actually. Um, I'm writing to you from the perspective of someone whose family was greatly affected by another executive order, EO 9066. 75 years ago, my family was uprooted and sent to the horse stalls and Puyallup fairgrounds then to Minidoka, Idaho, where I was born in this internment camp. You can see why I was greatly concerned with what is happening in our country now and why I felt such pride when I saw you in the news. Please keep up the fight. Uh, so that was from, a, like I said, a teacher at my elementary school. Um, and, and we got a fair number of letters like that from people who, who had been affected by the internment or whose families had been uh, about, about how, this, how much this meant to them. Uh, and then this one is from a lawyer in Washington, D.C., uh, who works with refugees. And she said, uh, your office's work has literally saved lives. Because of your case, I had many clients, including refugees and sick children, who were able to come to the U.S. after being turned back originally, despite having valid documents. And I want to also thank you on behalf of the Muslim American community, including naturalized Muslim Americans like myself. You all are heroes to us. Um, so it was, you know, not often, right, in your work as a lawyer, at least in my work as a lawyer, do you get letters uh, like that. So it was a powerful, powerful experience. We also got a, letters, a lot of letters from lawyers, by the way, just thanking us uh, for sort of making their kids think they were cool again. Um, uh, or that, you know, <laughs> being a lawyer could be a cool thing. But uh, those, those were nice, but a little bit less touching. Uh, uh, so then, uh, so the... the uh, so Judge Robart ruled Friday afternoon. That night, the federal government, the administration, told us they were going to appeal. Uh, the next day, around 9.30 at night, the Trump administration filed their appeal brief in the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit immediately told us that our response was due at midnight the next day, uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, that was, you know, as hardships go, that was, that was not, uh, not really comparable to other things others have dealt with. But... Um, but we, so we raced uh, through the night and all through that day uh, to get our brief filed. That was also the night, I'm sure it didn't snow out here, but it snowed in Seattle that night about three inches, which in Seattle is like a, you know, snowstorm. And uh, it was, anyway, getting home, it, it, was, it was an unforgettable evening in many ways. So we got our brief filed. Uh, the argument was on Tuesday. So we filed Sunday at midnight. The argument was on Tuesday at 2.30. And uh, normally for any big appellate argument in our office, we do three or four moot courts uh, with people across the office to help you prepare and think about different questions. And we had time to do one at 11.30 that day by phone, uh, which was actually incredibly helpful. But uh, so the government was arguing, again, standing, that the state couldn't bring this case. And then also just that basically the president's power to do this was unreviewable. And um, so I'm going to play this audio. You will think it's not working, but it is. And um, this is from, this I think was a sort of a key turning point in the, uh, in the oral Are argument. Are you arguing then that the president's decision in that regard is unreviewable? The, uh, yes. The okay, so that was, you might not have been able to hear, that was Judge Friedland, who was the judge presiding. She was asking the lawyer for the federal government, are you saying that the, that the president's discretion is unreviewable? And then a long, long, long silence. Uh, and, then, uh, and then basically, yes. And I'm not trying to pitch on him. He was put in an impossible position, I think, having to defend this thing on very little notice. Uh, uh, but but it, was, it was a telling answer, and it did not go over well with the Ninth Circuit. Uh, so they, they basically rejected all of the Trump administration's arguments. They said we had standing to our proprietary interests that's as, our, as a state running the universities, and that there's no precedent to support the claim of unreviewability. 
Uh, I mean, we had cited a number of cases, for example, the cases out of Guantanamo and other contexts where the, the Supreme Court has reviewed any number of actions that the executive has taken, even during war times, even about people detained overseas, much less about, you know, green card holders trying to get back into the country. Uh, that was when the humor highlight of the case occurred, uh, when President Trump sent this, uh, this tweet after we won in the Ninth Circuit, and the responses almost sort of wrote themselves, right? Like, where do you think we've been for the last two weeks? Uh, 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 anyway, uh, but so it seemed to be saying, though, that the charitable reading of that tweet was that they were going to take the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, but uh, cooler heads prevailed. Uh, they didn't do that. Uh, they decided not to appeal any further the first travel ban, and after about a month, uh, they, they withdrew their appeal, they paid our costs, and they issued the new executive order, the second travel ban, which made some significant changes compared to the first one, uh, sort of summarized here, and uh, made some pretty significant changes. I'm just going to go through that quickly. So we and others filed challenges to the second executive order, and uh, other states, other private uh, parties, uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, uh, ACLU, National Immigration Law Center, and there were hearings all over the country the day before the, the second order was to take effect. Um, one in Hawaii, one in Maryland, uh, one in Seattle. We sort of tacked ourselves on to the end of the hearing that, that uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project was having. And the judges in the Hawaii case and in the case in Maryland brought by the National Immigration Law Center and ACLU ruled first and ruled that the second travel ban was also illegal. And then our judge, Judge Robart, decided that he did not need to rule because it was already blocked, uh, which was a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but it meant that our, our case sort of got put on pause while those other cases went up on appeal, which is something some people are confused about why our case is not up on appeal, but that's, it's just sort of a happenstance of timing issue. Uh, the Fourth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit reviewing those decisions largely uh, upheld the, the rulings against the travel ban. The Trump administration asked the Supreme Court to stay the ruling, and um, that's one another one of the, I mean, the president's tweets throughout this case have been pretty amazing uh, uh, from a sort of legal ethics and just uh, from any number of perspectives. But uh, he sort of criticized the Justice Department, which he oversees and can tell what to do, um, for not appealing the original travel ban, which he, he certainly could have told them to do. But anyway, uh, uh, I think his, his criticisms of them and his descriptions of the second one is just a watered-down, politically correct version of the first one have definitely not helped the federal government's cause in defending the second travel ban. Uh, so I think this is my last slide. Yes, it is. And then I'll, um, I think we're going to do maybe some questions at the end. But the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Jorge, just sort of where do things stand now? Uh, so uh, unfortunately, the Supreme Court partially stayed the, the, the injunctions that uh, the judges in Hawaii and Maryland entered. So the court said that uh, it was going to put, the, the, it was going to continue to block the travel ban as to anyone who had a, a bona fide relationship uh, with a person or entity in the United States. So for, for uh, immigrants uh, coming to visit relatives, it meant a close family member. And uh, for refugees, it was a little bit less clear what that meant. And then there was some the administration narrowly interpreted that ruling in a variety of ways, and then Hawaii and uh, the other plaintiffs then challenged those interpretations and, and succeeded in getting them changed. So for example, the Trump administration originally interpreted the Supreme Court ruling to mean that if a grandparent was coming to visit their grandkids, that would not count as a close family member, so they could not, they could not come if they were from one of the six countries. Uh, the judge in Hawaii said, no, that's crazy. That's a, I think that's a quote. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, that grandparents would not be considered close family members and, and, and uh, modified the rule so that uh, grandparents and um, aunts and uncles, you, you know, people have to go, still have to go through the normal vetting process and all that, but if you're from one of those six countries and you're coming to visit one of those relatives, you, you can now do that if you're, if you're from one of those six countries. The Supreme Court will hear the case in October. People ask me constantly, what do you think is going to happen? And my somewhat... Uh, underwhelming response is, it's very hard to predict because I don't know what the president is going to do between now and then. Um, I think he's done a number of things that have made this case much, much harder for them, and there's going to be some really tough things for the administration about defending this order when it goes before the Supreme Court, including uh, the original stated purpose of the travel ban was to allow sort of a 90-day pause on, on immigration while they enhanced vetting procedures. And as far as anyone can tell, they haven't actually done anything in the much more than 90 days since then to enhance vetting procedures. 
so I think there's going to be some real tough questions from the court about was that really the point or was that just a pretext for the real goal of discrimination and keeping a campaign promise. So I'm, I'm at least somewhat hopeful about what the court will do. And uh, in the meantime, our office continues to you know, monitor a wide range of things that the new administration is doing on a variety of fronts. I'm happy to answer questions about that more later. But bottom line is, that's where things stand now. It was an incredible experience to be part of this uh, travel ban challenge. I wish, of course, that the executive order had never been issued in the first place. But getting to be a part of the team challenging it, with a lot of help from, from folks like Jorge and other organizations, was uh, really an incredible, uh, life-changing experience. So for now, I will, I, will, um, I will sit down and uh, thank you all so much for being here and for your time and attention. And we'll do some questions, I think, later on uh, at the end. I'm Dick Manning. I'm a member of the Clallam Jefferson County Pro Bono Lawyers Board. And uh, I want to thank uh, Aaron, Noah, and uh, uh, Jorge for coming out here to Port Angeles a long ways, at least driving wise and ferry boat wise, uh, to, to get out here to be part of this program. And before I uh, begin my remarks, I was, uh, when we were mingling in the reception area, I was thinking about who here doesn't and hasn't been directly affected by immigration. I don't think there can be, I don't think there can be anybody here who hasn't had a parent or a grandparent or a great grandparent that immigrated from some other part of the world. My maternal grandmother was born in Ennis, Ireland. I'm eligible for citizenship. Uh, my uh, great-grandparents on my dad's side, they all came from Ireland. Uh, and my wife, uh, Jen, she's first generation, uh, US generation born, Croatian and Italian. We are all affected by immigration. And we've always been a country uh, open to, to those who uh, qualify for admission to the U.S. Now, uh, Jorge Barron, he's an immigrant. He came from Colombia, and he is, uh, dad was a, a TV producer in Colombia. Uh, his dad uh, 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 created programs, uh, including a Sunday Kids uh, program. Jorge was a Hollywood star on that program. And by the, by the way, I wish we had a blow up of Jorge when he was this, I would guess, about 10 years old. And God, what a cute looking guy. And I just, I wish I'd, it'd be, he'd be the kind of a, a, a son that everybody would be proud to have in their family. So uh, he came to the US, to Virginia, as a teenager. Uh, he graduated from high school. He made his way to Yale and eventually graduated from law school in Yale. And uh, then uh, he served as a law clerk to somebody that I knew very well, Betty Fletcher, who is a judge of the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of uh, US, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco. Uh, he also uh, went to New Haven, Connecticut, where, by the way, most of my family came from, to Seattle and uh, served uh, in the New Haven, Connecticut Legal Assistance uh, uh, Service. And, uh, and then he eventually came to the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project in, based in Seattle, statewide agency. It has four offices throughout the state, about 70 staff members. And he came in 2003, and then uh, in 2008, he became its executive director. Um, uh, it wasn't very long before uh, uh, 
Jorge became uh, uh, well known in his nonprofit work, uh, the Puget Sound Business Journal, uh, uh, celebrated his leadership of uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project uh, in 2009 as being one of those under 40 leaders in the Puget Sound area. Whatever happened to that f under 40, Jorge? Now, I've known Jorge since I was uh, chairing the Equal Justice Coalition around 2004 or thereabouts in, in Seattle when he regularly attended meetings that we had about twice a month uh, at 7.30 in the morning to talk about what uh, help he could get for Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. Um, as some of you will remember, uh, NORP, uh, the acronym for this uh, organization, uh, had uh, a real impact on some activity that was going on in Port Angeles area around uh, 2011. Uh, the Border Patrol agents or officers, uh, uh, some of them were engaging in some pretty aggressive uh, tactics uh, which involved stopping drivers under the pretense of traffic violations and questioning them about their immigration status. They uh, weren't very wise in the way they went about this because some of those drivers they stopped were corrections officers <laughs> and U.S. citizens as well. And uh, so uh, uh, NORP along with the ACLU and some other uh, interested organizations uh, uh, were able to uh, negotiate a settlement in which uh, these practices uh, hopefully came to a stop and uh, the Border Patrol people were uh, agreed to go through some training to uh, uh, avoid the kind of uh, tactics that they had been engaging in before. Um, so uh, MORP is no stranger to this area. Um, I want to talk for just a moment in introducing Jorge. Unlike the criminal justice system is Derek Medina. By the way, Derek Medina, the guy that stood up here first and told you about uh, this uh, Clallam Jefferson pro bono lawyers and, and um, uh, talked about how he charges $250 an hour, but I will tell you what he didn't tell you is that Derek Medina is one of those volunteer lawyers who serves for zero dollars per hour. So here we are in, unlike the criminal justice system, uh, those detained, whether uh, it's a, a valid detention or an illegal detention or an invalid detention, they have no right to a lawyer. Now in the criminal justice system, anybody who can't afford a lawyer, uh, a criminal defense lawyer is appointed for them. Immigrants don't have that right. And something that a lot of people uh, who, who think about immigrant rights, and, and some of them are NIMBYs, not in my backyard, fail to realize that many of these people are here legally in this country and that they have, are, are not in violation of the immigrant laws. And yet, they are detained. And I gotta tell you, deportation is devastating. To, it, it breaks apart families. Uh, it uh, separates husbands from wives and children from their mothers and fathers. And it's a, it's a really, it's just simply disastrous. So. Uh, Jorge and his Northwest Immigrant Rights Project are standing as we, with very limited resources and they can't begin to help all the people who need help, but they're standing there uh, out there at the detention center uh, trying to offer legal advice to those who, who wish it. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, it, it, Jorge has talked about uh, uh, his focus and his attitude uh, towards this. And by the way, Jorge uh, Barron is, is about human rights, uh, not uh, politics. 
And his uh, advocacy uh, for the rule of law, for the accused to be heard and have the right to be judged fairly according to applicable law, it can be best summed up by what he himself has said, especially when a, a, a case is uh, uh, presented to him that, that may involve somebody who is even here, in fact, illegally and not in compliance with the law. And Jorge says, it's not our job to decide who's deserving and who's not. We see the right to having an attorney as a human right. With that, uh, I will uh, uh, welcome Jorge Barron to the podium here. And I want to thank him uh, from the bottom of our hearts for coming out here. Thank you. Well, I, I thank you, uh, Dick, for that uh, great introduction. And um, I should say that I think I think the organizers actually they got, got the order wrong because the the rock star should have gone second. You usually have the rock star in the you know you have the opening act that's like you know okay, but uh, but then you have the rock star. So, uh, but that's okay. Uh, we'll we'll manage with that. Uh, following Noah is definitely uh, a privilege, and I appreciate the work that the office has done. And I'm 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 just honored that all of you are here to learn more about this topic. Um, and, and I also appreciate, I want to echo what a lot of uh, people have said about the importance of the, of the local work, uh, the pro bono program here. Uh, we realize, you know, immigration, we're part of this alliance for equal justice uh, that, are, that is the sort of the constellation, the coalition of legal services providers around the state. And uh, we know the importance of uh, legal assistance in, in every realm. Of course, uh, our organization, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, is focused on the immigration field. But so many of our clients need assistance in other areas. Uh, we talk about you know, domestic violence issues, uh, landlord-tenant issues, uh, government benefits. In all of those areas, uh, we don't have the right to counsel in, in civil proceedings. And it's, it's so essential for people to be able to na navigate those systems. So I really appreciate your being here to help support the local efforts here to make sure that people in the community have support. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that you have some great uh, or, or local organizations that we've uh, partnered with uh, locally and some great efforts that are building, particularly in this time. Uh, there's an organization, uh, Ray Garrido's here from the Kitsap Immigrant Assistance Center uh, that is based in, in, in Kitsap, but they're partnering uh, with folks in Port Townsend and the Jefferson uh, Jefferson program, a new Jefferson program uh, on providing immigrant assistance, that's right, the immigrant rights advocates, uh, Libby Palmer knows here as well. And so there's a lot of local uh, leadership on this issue as well. Uh, the, the case that, um, Dick was mentioning with uh, the Border Patrol that the CLU and NERP were able to, to work on, uh, that case could not have been possible without the local advocates that uh, uh, you know, brought the, those issues to the attention. Uh, uh, folks uh, in Forks and the For Forks Human Rights Group, as well as the local advocates are crucial. So uh, I just think it's really important to support all of those entities uh, because without the work, and as, as, as Noah was talking about earlier, um, you know, no one entity can do this alone. Um, and I think it's just, an, um, the, you know, one of the things that I think the reason when people ask us, uh, and they've asked me a lot about why uh, all of these things are happening here in, in, in Washington State, I think it's because we've built this network of uh, uh, amazing organizations, uh, our, our government leaders, uh, who are supportive of these efforts. Um, and so I urge you to get involved in, in different ways. And there's a lot of ways here to plug in locally uh, as well. Um, so let me just uh, talk for a few minutes um, about, just wanted to share some, some uh, remarks about uh, our organization. And just a quick snapshot of, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, sorry, I'm like not so good with this. Uh, there we go. Um, so. Um, by the way, I'm standing by the podium because I'm, uh, I know this is being broadcast uh, w a website. I normally like to move around, uh, but, uh, but that's why I'm here. Uh, I wanted to explain a little bit about uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project for those of you that uh, don't know. Uh, Dick 
talked a little bit about the fact that we work in four different areas uh, around the state and two offices in eastern Washington. Uh, most of our work is focused on providing direct legal assistance on individual cases uh, and uh, working and navigating, helping people through the system. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those cases that we're working on right now uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, we also engage in when we find you know, patterns and problems that we think require systemic solutions, uh, we have the capacity to be able to take on some work on impact litigation and systemic advocacy to try to make changes uh, to the law, and I'll also talk about some of those efforts. Uh, and then we also engage in community education, uh, which is both, you know, these kind of events to talk to people about immigration policy more, uh, more broadly, but also obviously to, uh, to some of our client communities uh, uh, to make sure that they understand the realities of immigration law and understand their legal rights. Um, I want to begin by talking a little bit, just following up on, on Noah's presentation about the incredible work that the Attorney General's office did on uh, challenging the President's uh, executive order. And, um, you know, I, I, I just want to share a quick anecdote just to follow up uh, that, that presentation because um, uh, some of our legal team were, were some of the first people who showed up at CTEC. In fact, we have been told, um, you know, on Friday when the executive order was signed, uh, we had already gotten a call from uh, people in New York about a family that was coming uh, who is actually not from one of the countries, but we were worried that because they were refugees, they might be um, blocked. Uh, and they were arriving at SeaTac Airport at 6 o'clock the next morning. And so two of our staff attorneys were there like at 5.30 in the morning on that Saturday to just monitor whether this particular family was having trouble. So they were, you know, there. And we didn't really understand, I think at the time, the, the, quite the impact that this was going to have. Uh, so they were there. And as it turns out, that one family that we were focused on uh, actually went through okay. And they, they got delayed at the initially because of all the chaos and stuff. But, but, uh, but they were fine. But then they started seeing all these other people who were saying, like, you know, my, my family members being returned, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, we were in touch by phone. We were doing, I, was, I was at home on that Saturday morning. And eventually, because they'd been there since 5.30 in the morning and by, like, 11 o'clock, I said, you know, you guys need to go home. You know, I'll come to the airport and I'll, I'll relieve you so that we can kind of continue figuring all these things out. And so by the time I got to the airport, they had made contact with all these people. And um, we found out about this one family uh, who was, um, uh, who was who the airport officials had brought to his conference room and they wanted somebody to talk to them because they didn't know the, 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 their husband, they didn't know exactly what was happening. So I went in to talk to this family. Uh, it, was, it was a large, actually Somali family um, and all of them were crying when I walked into this conference room. And so I talked to them and tried to figure out what their situation was. And they, um, so the, one of the women uh, explained to me that uh, it was her husband uh, who was coming, who was finally coming, had gone through the whole process to come to the United States as a green card holder. So this was not a visit. This was like he was moving here to come to U.S. after this very long, years-long process to be able to get a, a, a you know, green card status, lawful permanent residence, to be able to come live here, and finally had been approved and had been on that plane that morning. And when he showed up, uh, they, because of the executive order, had denied him entry and uh, they were crying because they had just learned, just before I walked into the, to the room, he had been able to make a call. They, he hadn't been able to make a call. The, the uh, Customs Border Protection people would not let people use their phones when they were detained at the airport. So the only way he was able to call was when he, they would put him back on the plane to fly back to London, this British Airways flight. He borrowed the phone from somebody on the plane, and he called to say, they're sending me back. And that had just happened 20 minutes ago, and the plane had just left. Uh, and so he was on his way back to, uh, to, uh, to Europe where he had started his travel uh, and he was, you know, barred from doing this. And so the family was very distraught, you know, and I got information about their case. Um, but, you know, there was nothing we could do at that point for that family. Uh, and in the meantime, other people were pulling me away because they said, you know, there's other people who are on a, on a, on a later flight that are also going to be sent back and we need to start working on them. And so... You know, I left one of our staff members to, to talk to this one family, but I, but I had to turn to, to a couple of other people that we were trying to figure out what we could do. And, and, and as it turned out, it, we were successful in actually blocking the deportation of, of two of those folks later on, the, on, on another flight after a, a long <laughs> uh, uh, battle on that case. Um, but what was even re more rewarding uh, was that uh, about a week and a half later, um, I was able to go back to the airport 
and this was after the, what Noah explained uh, of that ruling by Judge Schrobart that you heard uh, that led to that same gentleman who had been sent back on that plane to be able to return uh, about 10 days later, and I was able to see the reunion of that family uh, with, uh, with that, um, you know, to, to be reunited. So that's the, and, and that's one of the things that I wanted to sort of focus on in my remarks is to talk about that, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about, sometimes we talk about this in the abstract, uh, but I want to emphasize how this is the real life impact that, that this is having. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the cases that I want to, want to talk about is um, uh, the case of uh, Jue Ali, who's one of our clients, uh, and just to illustrate how this continues to have impact. Um, so Ms. Ali uh, is one of those people that we've been working with uh, as a client in our individual work. Uh, so she's originally from Somalia. She came when she was a child to the U.S. as a refugee. And she's since, you know, gone through the process. She, she got a green card and she's been, she grew up here uh, and has been living here and ultimately has become a U.S. citizen. Um, a few years ago, um, she went back to Somalia after the situation in Somalia had stabilized somewhat and wanted to see her extended family. So she and her mom went back and, and made a trip there. And while she was on this, on this extended trip there, she met uh, a Somali man and they had uh, they started a relationship and, and uh, eventually had a son uh, in Somalia. And she didn't feel like she could take care of him here, so she left him behind in, in Somalia uh, with the expectation that uh, she would bring him to the to U.S. Uh, to live here. And um, so she uh, was one of the people who came to us to, um, to file this uh, family visa petition process to bring her uh, son here to Somalia, uh, to, from, from Somalia. And, um, you know, we've been working. It's a, it's a complicated process. You have to go through all these steps and file this paperwork and, and proof. And especially in places like Somalia, it's, it's, it's challenging because of uh, getting documents and stuff takes a long time. And so it's been, you know, uh, uh, over a year process. And as it turns out, we actually filed sort of the last round of paperwork on January 20th of this year. Uh, it wasn't planned that way, it's just, that's just the timing that happened. Uh, but you know, we thought, okay, we're, we're close now. We're, we, you know, we're, we're almost done with the, with the process and, and the next steps would be you know, to get an interview uh, and eventually to get the visa for him to come over. Uh, but then of course, the travel ban came into place. And as Noah mentioned, this situation applied very broadly. And so uh, Miss Ali, uh, despite the fact that we're talking about a seven-year-old kid, uh, he was subject to the travel ban as a potential security risk to the United States. Um, and so he was blocked from accessing the United States and being able to come to the United States. So, um, so she became one of our, our plaintiffs. She's actually the lead plaintiff in one of our cases, Ali versus Trump, which is the, uh, the case that Noah was referencing that's still pending before the courts, uh, challenging uh, the, you know, initially it, it challenged the first travel ban, and now it's still pending regarding the second travel ban. Um, but the reason that I bring up her case is because her child's still not here. Uh, uh, one of the things that we've seen is that there's been delays in the processing of some of these applications. And so um, uh, Ms. Ali's son actually has an interview scheduled for late August in, uh, in Kenya. And we don't know if uh, the final processing is going to happen before the Supreme Court decides the, tr the travel ruling, uh, the travel ban case. And so if the Supreme Court rules against us, if the Supreme Court says that the president does have this authority to ban people uh, from these countries, it is entirely possible that Ms. Ali's son will be stuck outside the U.S. and that these two, that the seven-year-old kid is going to be separated from their mother. Um, so there are certainly, you know, huge constitutional and legal issues that are going to be decided by the, by the, by the case of the Supreme Court. But at the same time, I also don't want us to lose out about the fact that what this means, because for this family, uh, imagine, for those of you that have children, what it means to be separated from your children and be in this situation where you can't have your, your, your child with you. Uh, that's what this case is really ultimately about. Um, so that's one of the things that has been different uh, in our work over the last six months. Uh, I wanted to just share a few other things that have changed uh, since the Trump administration came into office, because uh, people often ask us about, you know, what what's what's new what's what's different um and um and these are all the numbers i'm going to show you by the way don't don't worry I, I, i'm not being into statistics but I, I did think it was important to share some 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 statistics 
Um, so we have felt um, and we've sort of noticed a, a, anecdotally an increase certainly in immigration enforcement, the number of people being arrested locally, but we didn't have a lot of data until, until recently about that. And finally, the, the, the administration released some, some preliminary data about uh, how things have changed in the first three months of the administration. Um, and what's that shown at the, at the national level, uh, there's been a 37% increase in the number of arrests uh, of people by immigration and customs enforcement agents uh, at, the, at the national level. Um, so that's the overall number. Uh, but one of the things that we've noticed is there's been a shift in who is being targeted for immigration enforcement. Um, and so the biggest increase, and that's on the level, and this is the regional number, the 360% increase, is on people who have no criminal record. Um, so the Obama administration was focusing more, more of its resources on people who had been convicted of more serious uh, criminal offenses, uh, but the Trump administration has really, uh, I hesitate to say broadened because it really, I would say, eliminated any kind of prioritization. They've made it very clear that everybody is subject to uh, immigration enforcement, and so the huge increase has been on people who have no criminal record and some folks who have you know, very long ties to the community who have been picked up, and I'll talk a little bit about how that happens. So that's what's happened. This is this is the you know the beginning of what you know uh, uh, you know admittedly the the president said he was going to do, which is to really ramp up immigration enforcement. And so now we have data to say this is happening. Um, the that increase and in both the rhetoric and the actual impact and the actual you know change in policy has had other. Um, you, know, you know, obviously this, this impact, and I'll talk a little bit about how this plays out on the ground level, obviously has a very direct impact in the number of families who get separated and the impact on the individuals who get uh, detained, obviously. Um, but I also wanted to flag that there's also what I would call uh, uh, an indirect impact, impact, but in some ways it could be almost just as harmful, which is that it's leading to a tremendous fear in the community about a number of things. And so you see here a negative 40%. Uh, and that's just one statistic that I want to share with you, and that actually comes from, from uh, the Houston area in Texas. Um, in the city of Houston, they reported in the county that, that includes uh, um, Houston, they saw a 40% drop in the number of sexual assault uh, incidents reported by Latinos in the, in the area of Houston in the first three months of this year. And... Uh, Nobody knows, you know, it's, it's impossible to know exactly why that happened. Uh, but the actual reports of sexual assault for other, for people who are not Latinos, went up by a few percentage points. Um, so the only impact is having on this community, and we've seen reports of that throughout the country, uh, perhaps not as dramatic as in Houston area. We've seen drops in Los Angeles and Denver and other areas that there's been a tremendous retrenchment of people and the fact that people are not reporting uh, the fact that there's criminal activity, that there have been victims of crime, other things. And, you know, and I want to say, I know a lot of times people will say, well, you know, the, uh, sometimes people will say, well, you know, those people are in the country without permission, you know, so, I, and I want to say, you know, I, of course, you know, reject that because everybody should have the right to be protected and be safe. Um, but even to those people who might feel that way, I say, you know, think about it if somebody who's undocumented is walking by your house right now, um, and they see that somebody is breaking into your house, right? And they hesitate calling law enforcement because they're afraid that you know, if they call law enforcement, they're gonna get you know, put into deportation proceedings. Now, nothing is gonna happen to the undocumented person, they're just gonna go about their business. But your house got broken into, and somebody else's house is gonna get broken into because that person wasn't held accountable. So we're all less safe when people are afraid to come forward and report what they see. So we think this is a damage that's, that's it's hard to quantify. I can't tell you because you know, that person didn't get you know, arrested in the, in, the, in the burglary, right? But um, uh, we won't know necessarily that that, that, that that call could have been made and that, that uh, incident could have been prevented. Um, but those are impacts that we think are happening right now. Now, another thing that's changed is uh, the reflected by this number 39,324. And um, this deals with the number of detention, immigration detention beds that are funded by the federal government. Uh, and so this number has actually been increasing uh, over the last two decades. Uh, the government, uh, our federal government has been 
increasingly spending more and more resources to detain people in immigration detention centers. Um, and uh, when, you know, if we were talking about, you know, back in the early 2000s, that number would have been in the order of, you know, six, 7,000. Uh, and that's the number of people who we fund to be detained each day. Uh, and uh, that number has increased uh, steadily through both, you know, uh, Democratic and, and, um, and Republican administrations. And uh, when uh, President uh, uh, Trump uh, came into office, uh, that was at 34,000. Uh, that was the peak that it reached during the Obama years. And now in the new um, bill that was approved in April for the new budget, it's gone up to 39,324. That's where we are now. The, right now, Congress is considering increasing it yet again. The House of Representatives, so ICE, uh, the Trump administration requested 51,000 for that number, and um, uh, the House of Representatives has, has uh, at least the Appropriations Committee, has approved a budget of for 44,000. So already a big increase from um, from what we have uh, now, which is already very high by historical standards. Um, and so how does that play out here locally? Um, and how do those numbers get reflected? Well, here in our region, we have the now, what is now the third largest immigration detention center in the country in Tacoma, the Northwest Detention Center. Now this is a, um, this is a privately owned facility. I wanna start off by, by noting that. So this is not a building that's owned by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, by the federal government. This is owned by a private corporation known as the Geo Group. Uh, it's a multinational, uh, you know, publicly held corporation that has detention centers uh, here in, in, in the US, in Australia, and the UK. And they uh, contract out these facilities, these detention centers to uh, to uh, the government, and uh, they, uh, you know, as you might expect, their their stock has really surged uh, since the, the the presidential election uh, because they're expecting, of course, and as we've seen, the the um, business to grow. So um, so people are there uh, at the Northwest Detention Center, and um, this is uh, a view of what the detention center looks like. And I think one of the things that uh, you know, people ask us, like, how long are people in detention? And it's, it's you know, it, it's a range. Um, I think if you ask the statistics, I believe it's that it's about 87 days on average. Uh, but the problem is that there could be people who are, you know, not fighting the case and will be there for, you know, two or three weeks. Uh, and there may be somebody who's, you know, fighting for asylum that could be there for several years. So I've had a, I've had a client who was there for four for uh, four years and two days, and we know we've had clients in, in, at uh, NERP that have been there for over five years. So people are there uh, detained, and they're there not for any criminal conviction, uh, they're there on the basis of a claim by immigration that they violated immigration laws in some way, and so that's the decision. Uh, they're waiting the decision as to whether they're gonna be allowed to stay in the U.S. or not. Um, and you know, a little bit of what uh, Dick was mentioning earlier, so people in going through that process have to go, um, in most circumstances, will get a chance to appear before an immigration judge. And, uh, and this is a little bit of what a courtroom looks like in, in there. And you know, you can't, you know, they won't let us take pictures when, when there's actually people in there. Uh, but basically it looks like a lot of courtrooms in, you know, in, in the US, you know, you have a, a judge with a black robe in one side and then on the other side you have a government prosecutor who's, a, who's an employee of ICE, of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, who's, who's making the arguments, an attorney who's making the case for why the person should be deported. And then on the other side is another desk and there's the person who's facing deportation, um, but what's not always there is an attorney to represent that person. Because as Dick mentioned, you don't, we don't have the, there's no right to appointed attorneys in immigration court, uh, generally, except for one narrow exception that I'll talk about in a minute, um, to, to get representation in immigration, in immigration court uh, in, in detention. And the statistics are pretty bad about representation in Tacoma. Uh, the latest stats that we have are that 92% of people who go through immigration court proceedings at the detention center do not have an attorney representing them in immigration court. Um, and so the reason, and, 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 and you know, and the reason that that's important is not just because, you know, lawyers are wonderful people. Um, it's, it's because of the difference it makes on whether the person can get status. So when somebody's applying for asylum, uh, what are the forms of protection to try to, sit, to be able to stay in the United States? If you have an attorney in 
uh, in your case, your chances of succeeding in that case are in the order of 42 to 45 percent. But if you don't have an attorney representing your case, your chances of winning are up 3 percent. And so that's the only, you know, a case could be completely the same, but your chances of prevailing on the case are uh, just so tiny if you don't have an attorney representing you. Um, so people are given a list. Um, so when people come in and don't have an attorney, they are given uh, what they call the list of pro bono legal services providers. And I know it's, it's it maybe hard to read. Um, this is the list that's given currently in Tacoma. And you know, I appreciate that they have three different listings there, but it's unfortunately three of our offices, so it all ends up in the same place. Um, so, um, so the 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 challenges in the detention center are are pretty pretty stark right now. Um, we're we're very excited about the fact that Ray and his team are 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 taking on some of those cases now as well. So that's uh, helping expand the capacity. Um, so who ends up in the detention center? Who, are, who, who ends up at these, in these situations? Um, I wanted to share just a couple of stories so that you understand who might end up at the Northwest Detention Center. Uh, and let me start with the case of um, uh, one of our uh, clients, Emmanuel. He, um, he came to the United States when he was about seven years old um, and with his family. And, and he's one of those individuals that's often referred to as dreamers uh, because he came here at a very young age and uh, has grown up here, went to high school. This is a picture from his high school graduation. Uh, had, uh, he, lives in, he actually lives in the Portland area, and he had been living there and uh, going to school, finished school, started working. Uh, and he's one of those folks who qualified for this program that some of you may have heard called the DACA program, which is something that President Obama launched in 2012 uh, after uh, there was a, a, a legislative proposal to give some of these undocumented youth the opportunity to qualify for 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 actual a path to citizenship, and that legislative proposal failed. It's it's known as the Dream Act, which is why people re refer to these folks as dreamers, and um, and so President Obama said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, as a matter of executive uh, action, going to say we're not going to move to deport these folks. We're going to give them the opportunity to, you know, uh, go through this background check process and give them a, a work permit uh, until we resolve their situation and make him not a priority for deportation. And so that program has been in effect since 2012, and Emmanuel was one of those people who benefited from that program. Um, Unfortunately, Emmanuel earlier this year had a, a bad car accident. Uh, he, he actually, he was hit by a car, I should say. He was, uh, he was skateboarding with some of his friends in his neighborhood and he was hit by a car pretty badly and he ended up in the hospital. Both of his legs were broken and he ended up in a wheelchair temporarily um, as he recovered from this. And one of the things that happened was that he, uh, being in the, in the wheelchair, um, he uh, felt very vulnerable because kids in the neighborhood started kind of harassing him about the fact that he was in a wheelchair and he started getting very nervous uh, that he was going to get hurt. And so he, um, he felt like he needed to do something to sort of defend himself and so he got a knife as a sort of self-defense tool. And the next time that the kids, the youth in the area came to like uh, to make fun of him and harass him, he pulled out the knife. And one of these kids called the police. And the police came and showed up and arrested Emmanuel because he, uh, on, on this charge of uh, displaying a weapon. And, um, and because of that arrest, uh, the immigration came and detained uh, Emmanuel and took him to the detention center. And not only that, but said that because of that, he was going to lose his DACA status um, and that he was going to be subject to deportation proceedings. So Emmanuel was taken to the detention center. He was still in his wheelchair when he was taken to the detention center, and uh, he was held there. Um, we were um, uh, able to get him a volunteer attorney to work on his case and was able to get a bond hearing for him. He has since been able to pay his bond and get a release from detention. Is back in, in, in Portland, but his deportation case is still pending. So the decision as to whether Emmanuel gets to stay in the U.S., is still up in the air right now in the immigration courts. So that's one case um, that uh, is, uh, uh, you know, an illustration of people who get uh, end up at the detention center. Um, another person who actually is still at the detention center as we gather here this evening is uh, Mr. Chung Kim. Now, Mr. Kim came actually earlier than Emmanuel. He was five years old when he came to Uni the United States. He, he was adopted. Um, uh, here and came and grew up in the United States 
Uh, he's originally, he was born in South Korea, but he's lived in the U.S. since he was five. Uh, he grew up here, and he eventually actually enlisted in the Army. Uh, he was actually a lawful permanent resident, so he has, a, he has a green card. He's had a green card since he moved to the U.S., but he's never taken that final step of becoming a U.S. citizen. And he was, uh, he was in the Army. Uh, he served. He actually was a driver in Iraq and was served in combat areas there, served honorably, and he was eventually uh, honorably discharged from the military. So he's a U.S. Army veteran. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, like uh, uh, many veterans, the experiences that he had uh, cost him, uh, 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 led him to have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and led to uh, some problems when he came home, uh, which in, uh, eventually ended up with uh, some substance abuse issues that led to some criminal convictions. And that, uh, those criminal convictions, uh, despite the fact that they were not, uh, uh, nobody was hurt, um, and uh, he actually didn't spend a lot of time in, in jail because of that. Uh, there was enough to get the government to consider that he should be deported, despite all of the fact that he's lived here this whole time. And uh, Mr. Kim is sitting in detention right now, facing deportation uh, to South Korea, a place that he hasn't been since he was five years old. And again, he was somebody who's been here with uh, lawful status and who has served in the military. So these are the folks that we're talking about when we're talking about people in immigration detention. I could tell you right now about you know, 1,573 other stories of people who are in the immigration detention center, uh, but just, I think, we, you know, I think you get the point. Um, so, uh, so that's some of the work that we're doing, we're working on right now on, the, on direct services. Uh, wanted to just kind of quickly mention about some of the other cases that we're working on in impact litigation, uh, meaning some of the systemic to make challenges. I talked about uh, the Ali versus Trump case that is still pending with regard to the Muslim ban. Uh, we're also working on a case with a number of partners nationally uh, called JFM versus Sessions. Uh, this case is challenging the fact that children, so I mentioned how people don't get, have a right to appoint a counsel in immigration court proceedings. That includes children. So if, even if you're, uh, so we, you know, we have a situation where people, uh, young children sometimes come to U.S. unaccompanied and uh, arrive to the border without their parents, without anybody taking care of them, and, um, and while they go through a different process in terms of uh, where they end up, the deportation case is treated kind of the same thing as an adult. You still have to go to immigration court, and you still have uh, this hearing before the judge. And if you don't have an attorney, you, you have to defend yourself in immigration court, even if you are a three-year-old. Uh, in fact, one of the you know, depositions that we did in this case, the, one of the chief judges said that you know, he's seen some three-year-olds three -year do a good job in immigration court, and you can, and you can do it. Uh, which is, you know, quite remarkable. I, I have a four-year-old, and he's, he's pretty smart. I'm pretty biased about that, but I, I don't think he'd do very well. If, if Noah Purcell doesn't understand the immigration laws, you know that's, that's challenging, right? So right now, we're still fighting that case. So unfortunately, right now, we still have the situation that children are facing uh, immigration courts without, without uh, appointed attorneys, uh, but we're fighting on that front. Uh, we're also working on a case called Nerve versus Sessions. Um, I like these cases that are Nerve versus, by the way. Uh, uh, so this is a case that was filed uh, because the Department of Justice, uh, uh, after the, some of the work that we did in the, in the uh, airport, um, came after us uh, as an organization trying to uh, prevent us from providing limited legal representation to people in immigration court hearings. So because we can't help everybody who's facing deportation hearings in terms of providing them full representation, we often help people by, by doing limited assistance. So helping them, for example, fill out an as asylum application form that they can then submit to the court. So they came after us saying we couldn't do that. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I won't get into the details of why, but, um, but the good news is that we've challenged that and uh, we've now gotten two favorable rulings from another one of the judges in uh, another, uh, actually, uh, Bush appointed judge, uh, Judge uh, Richard Jones in the um, uh, Washington uh, District Court um, and uh, he's uh, blocked that, that uh, ruling against us or that order against us. Uh, we also have a case called NERP versus USCIS that is about asylum seekers 
uh, being denied work permits when they're entitled to them uh, that uh, we're working on. And a couple of cases that I wanted to mention that we've now uh, completed, uh, one of them is called Franco Gonzalez versus Holder that we worked with our partners at the ACLU and a number of other organizations at the national level. And this was a case that was about, you know, mentioned that there's one exception to people who don't have, uh, that the, the general rule that people don't have a right to appoint a counsel in immigration court proceedings, uh, and it's because of this case. Um, so this involved situations where people were facing the immigration court hearings without representation and who had uh, serious mental disabilities. So they, they, people who sometimes were, have been in the criminal justice system and have been declared you know, incompetent to stand trial because of their mental uh, health, uh, and they were sent to immigration det detention and they were facing deportation hearings, and now they were incompetent to stand trial in the criminal system, but they were supposed to represent themselves in immigration court. Uh, so we challenged that and uh, uh, a federal district court uh, ordered um, after a long uh, legal process uh, for the federal government to now appoint counsel for people with mental disabilities in immigration court. So now those folks are the only class right now of people who get appointed counsel, uh, at least in the western U.S., uh, that, that's covered by the ruling. And then, uh, you know, Dick mentioned the, the Sanchez versus Border Patrol case involving uh, racial profiling here in the, in the peninsula. And, um, and, you know, again, I just want to say that th that was uh, definitely a, a big team effort in, in uh, challenging those practices. Uh, I, I don't want to say that that's, you know, solved the problem. Uh, we know we're very concerned about the fact that, especially with this new administration, we might have challenges in that front. Uh, but it was good to be able to at least uh, put notice uh, that we were not, uh, that, you know, people were going to stand up and fight against, uh, against those policies. And again, can't thank enough the work of the local um, um, uh, groups that collaborated in that effort. Um, now, I want to just shift for a couple minutes very quickly to why we have some of the issues that we have with regard to immigration policy. And, and I'm just going to say that a lot of it's sometimes my perception. And, and I want to acknowledge that I have a, I have a, you know, perspective on immigration issues. And I want to acknowledge up front that there are very different perspectives on immigration policy. I think that's one thing that we could all agree on, right? Um, and, and so I think that, and, and I think it's an issue that's very important, right? I mean, and in some ways, I think that's precisely what gets complicated is because it is a very fundamental question, right? I mean, immigration policy at the end of the day is who, what's the future of the country gonna look like, right? And so it engenders a lot of passion. Um, and I think one of the things that I could concern about is that sometimes people uh, who are sort of in the middle, who are not sure or haven't, you know, gotten into the issues as in depth as perhaps I have, um, uh, you know, get a little turned off by the fact that there's so much, you know, uh, passion, let's say, on both sides of the issue, and it's hard to sort of figure out where you stand. Um, and so I think what happens is that it actually leads to a lot of people, a lot of confusion, a lot of myths, and a lot of misperceptions about the ways that immigration policy actually plays out. Um, and so I just wanted to talk for a couple minutes about some of the confusion that I see with regard to immigration policy. Instead of talking about all the different ways that people can get immigration status, just to, just to share some of the things that I think people often perceive uh, about immigration policy that turn out to be wrong. Um, so. One of the things is that there's this perception about the fact that like there's all these options for people to be able to get what we in immigration law refer to as green cards or frequently refer to as green cards. So lawful permanent residence, that's the, 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 the um, status that you get to be able to stay here in the United States and eventually apply for U.S. citizenship. And, you know, we often get people who tell us, who come in and say, well, you know, but these people can't, you know, they've been living like, like uh, uh, Emmanuel, they've been living in the U.S. since they were seven, clearly they should just, they haven't gone around to getting their paperwork or something, right? And the problem is that, no, the fact that you came here at a young age under immigration laws is not an avenue for you to be able to get a green card. I mean, that's, that's what that, pro that program, the DREAM Act, that's the legislative proposal that we've talked about, the DREAM Act, that's what it would do, but that's not law right now. So those folks don't have that avenue. They have the, the DACA program that the President Obama launched, but that's not a path to a green card. That's just a temporary thing that may be actually at risk uh, under this administration to, to go away. Um, similarly, people say, well, you know, this person, you know, they might contact our office and say, you know, this person's been living here for 25 years. Um, clearly, there must be something 
if you um, if you uh, you've been living here that long to be able to qualify to get immigration status. Um, and there really isn't. Uh, an immigration attorney reminded me there, there is one program. You need to have been here since 1972 to qualify. Um, so there's not people that have been here quite that long. Um, so no, but the fact that we run into people who've been here for 30, 35 years, there is no program that says that if you've been living here that long, uh, you get to uh, uh, be able to stay in the United States. Uh, the other misconception that I hear frequently is, oh, if you have children who are US citizens who are born here, you can, qual you can, get, you can stay. Um, no, uh, you know, like some things, there may be, you know, some grain of truth to this, but, I, but it's a very inefficient process if you want to do it that way. Let me explain. So if you want to try to qualify by having a child who's a U.S. citizenship, you, you know, you, you can come, you can have the U.S. citizen child, but you have to wait until they're 21 years old to apply, okay? So at that point, the 21-year-old kid can, or not kid at that point, right, adult, son, can apply, or, or daughter can apply for you to get a green card. Now, but if you came to the country without permission, you're going to have to leave the country for 10 years before you can get the green card. So it really, it's going to take 31 years to be able to get the green card that way. So not really an option for most people. Um, the other one is, you know, being a very good committed worker that you've been working a, a long time. So I can't tell you how many times we've had business owners come to our office, you know, very distraught. And they say, my... Uh, you know, the, the guy who runs my landscaping business is, is just got detained, is in Tacoma, and he's like, you know, key, he's been working for me for 20 years, and I got to get him out of detention, and clearly there must be a way that I can sponsor him for a green card. And the answer is no, not really. As a practical matter, those kind of, you know, jobs, you're not going to be able to get a, an employment visa for, for that kind of job. Um, you know, people who get employment visas are people who have advanced degrees, um, you know, if you're a baseball player or a, a fashion model, uh, you can get a green card. Uh, but not, I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I'm just saying those are the people that get green cards. I mean, that's just true. Okay. Um, now, other things in terms of policy about uh, immigration that I often hear that I just wanted to touch on three things in particular. And again, you know, I acknowledge that there's a lot of perspectives on this issue, but I think there's three things that there's a lot of evidence that, that I hear in the debates that are just simply not true. Uh, the first one is that immigrants lead to higher crime rates. I mean, clearly that's something that the president has, has said. And, you know, they've done a lot of research on this topic. And, um, and, you know, if there's any evidence about the impact that immigrants have on crime, it's that actually it reduces crime. Uh, so they've looked at this in different ways. They've looked at, you know, people and demographics, and they've said, well, if you're, um, uh, you know, it, it, they compared, for example, incarceration rate of people who are uh, uh, born in the U.S. versus people who are born outside the United States, and people who are born in the U.S. are about four times more likely to end up in jail than people who are born outside the United States. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about those of you that were born in the United States, but I'm just saying, statistically speaking, you're all more likely to end up in jail than I am. Uh, because I was born outside the U.S. So, you know, they've, anyway, they've looked at other ways to do it, and, and that's, so the evidence is not there about that. Uh, the other one is about how undocumented immigrants don't pay taxes, um, which, you know, is funny to say in the state of Washington, because I always ask people, has anybody ever had their passport checked when you pay anything at the cash register? I mean, maybe they check your ID if you're buying alcohol, right? But uh, but not your citizenship status. So everybody pays sales tax, right? But I think people are talking about and that in terms of the payroll taxes and stuff like that. But, you know, I think most people, you know, know that a lot of undocumented people, if not the majority of undocumented people, are working using, you know, fake social security numbers. Frequently something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? And so they work and they use that number, et cetera. And so what happens is, you know, the, the employer deducts, you know, Social Security uh, and payroll taxes out of, that, out of that paycheck, and they send it to the Social Security Administration, like they do, you know, for anybody else who's working on that uh, uh, and gets uh, the, the information uh, deducted, right? And they send the money to the federal government. And then they get that, the Social Security Administration gets that money and say, like, you know, this, this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we don't have a record of that number. Uh, we'll just keep the money, right? And then, you know, figure out if somebody claims it. And we actually have like literally billions of dollars of that money that we kept. In fact, the Social Security Administration has said that if it wasn't for the earnings of undocumented workers, the whole Social Security crisis of, you know, our running out of money in the Social Security Trust Fund would, would happen like 12 years earlier 
than it is because those folks are all putting money into the system that they're not taking out because they're not eligible for Social Security benefits. So, so it's really disingenuous to say that they're not contributing to the to to taxes. Um, and then, you know, of course, the other sort of uh, thing that we hear a lot is about immigrants taking job, jobs away from Americans. And I do want to acknowledge that this one's a little m more complicated because there are some areas where immigrants uh, 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 and, and undocumented immigrants may displace other workers, uh, but that tends to happen, actually, the people who are most impacted, the evidence that it shows is that to the extent that there's impact, it usually tends to be against other immigrants, uh, that there's displacement. Uh, but overall, the picture is pretty clear that more immigrants lead to actually uh, uh, more growth, and so it ends up being that there's actually more jobs overall. And I think, you know, if you talk to people, particularly in eastern Washington, I, I hear this a lot. They say, you know, if it wasn't for the undocumented workers, which are estimated to be about 80% of the workforce in agricultural industry, um, you know, you wouldn't have the jobs of the people, the truckers who are driving the cherries to the port, and the people at the port who have, you know, all of those jobs that tend to be uh, uh, U.S. Uh, workers uh, in those areas. So, um, so I think it's really important uh, if you take, and, and, and one of the things is don't take it from me. <laughs> uh, if, if you take nothing away with today's conversation is please don't just, you know, listen to the headlines. I mean, the fact that you're here already shows me you're not one of those people. But I hope that you will take today as just being the beginning of a conversation and engagement on this topic because there is far too much, you know, uh, rhetoric that gets thrown around with 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 uh, things, and uh, and I think the more people engage in this topic, uh, the better the policy will be. So I'm going to pause, and I look forward to your questions as well. And I believe I'm in charge of introducing the next speaker. So um, uh, so I'm going to make it very quick because it's a very dear friend of mine. It's a it's somebody who's kind of local. I think I can describe it as local. Uh, Annie Benson, who is the director of uh, the Immigration Project at the Washington Defenders Association, and who has been, you know, she's one of those kind of quiet heroes uh, that do amazing work to keep people in our community uh, from ending up in the Immigration Detention Center in many ways uh, by helping educate uh, um, the public defense system, the criminal defense system on the impact that that system has on immigration proceedings. And so Annie's work is amazing because of all the policy advocacy she does, but also because uh, of all the preventive work that she does. Um, she's kind of like in our, in our field, she's kind of like the, 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 the family doctor who vaccinates people and takes care of people before they get sick. Uh, and so it's really essential, the work that she does. And, um, and she also f happens to be a former staff member at NERP. Um, so we appreciate that, of course, as well. And uh, I'm honored to have uh, Annie follow me. Thank you. Okay, bear with me here while I figure out how. Let's start with the tech thing. Actually, why I'm doing that? Okay, first of all, you know I am in the unenviable position of not only following one rock star, but following two rock stars. <laughs> so, um, why I take a deep breath and step into that, how about we do what I call the... Uh, <clears throat> the, inter the intermission hokey pokey. So stand up in your chair, shake it out, take a deep breath, say hey to somebody next to you. Okay. Yeah, that'd be, let's see. Uh, where, oh, here we go. I'm sorry, did we exit out of this one? What am I? Down here, we're going to close this one. Yes, we're going to close this one. Oh. Did I close it? Well, there it is. Great. Thank you. And then I'm going to... Sorry. No worries. Mm -hmm. And then I have a... Um, I have a recording here, yes, so I'm just going to, oh good, so then how do I get to it from here? Um, so when, when it's, need to get to it, minimize, yep. and then go to, 
Great. Good. Thank you. Now, the problem you're going to have with the lapel mic, there's no place to really put the receiver or anything. I'm sorry, the, the lapel mic. The wireless mic. Said you, oh, I'll, you just, stay, I'll stay here. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll if try and stay here. If you want to walk around, uh -huh. here's the handheld mic. Oh, great. Oh, good. Thank you. So, yes, and is it I, just I have to, to get around? back up there. So, start off with that mic. When I get back up there, then I'll bring the volume up on that. Oh, you know what? Actually, I'll just stand here. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, folks, um, if you want to sit back down, we'll, we'll step into the, to the next part of the presentation <clears throat> or discussion or conversation that we're having here. Okay, so when they were putting the agenda together. First of all, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. And as I said, it's especially an honor to be sharing the stage with, um, <clears throat> with Noah, uh, whom I've admired from afar. I have the pleasure of working with some of the folks uh, in his office, and it's great to be in the same place with him. And also uh, wonderful to be following my longtime friend and as we've already established, rock star Jorge. Um, and there's a few other folks I want to just check in with uh, and acknowledge here in the audience tonight. Um, I think her, uh, Jorge has already um, given a shout out to um, Ray Garrido and Libby Palmer uh, and the folks from, um, they are some of the awesome community advocates here that I have had the pleasure of working with and will look forward to continuing doing so. And the other folks that I really want to give a shout out to um, are really the unsung heroes uh, to, uh, that are in the audience among us today. Um, and those are the uh, attorneys, the civil uh, attorneys uh, working at Northwest Justice Project. Ariel, are you here? Are there other folks here? And then, you know, uh, the other folks that I really uh, want to shout out and give uh, really a warm acknowledgement are, are the public defenders who are in the audience here. Yes. <laughs> and in particular, we have the public defenders uh, in, um, in Port Townsend. Uh, and also, where's Harry? Harry Gaznick. For those of you who live in Port, Towns, Port Angeles, Harry Gaznek is the head of the Port Angeles Public Defenders and has been a tireless defender, not just of people who are accused of crimes, but of all of our constitutional rights. And he has been doing that for more than 30 years. Stand up, Harry. So please. He is one of my own personal heroes, and I have the good fortune of actually working for Harry um, <clears throat> because I work for public defenders throughout the state, um, representing uh, people who are, if you are in the criminal justice system, if you are accused of crime, obviously you are in a difficult position. Um, and as we know, the majority of people who end up in the criminal justice system are, that are accused of crimes are people who are uh, people of low income, people who are uh, being represented by public defenders. So they are people facing issues of poverty and also people, uh, the criminal justice system disproportionately targets people of race. So um, I like to think of folks who are in the criminal justice system as um, <clears throat> the, uh, the triple marginalized Right, they are in the criminal justice system, accused of crimes. They're low income, and they are uh, they are generally, or the majority of them, are people of color. So, if they are the triple marginalized, if you happen to be a non-citizen, you are the quadruply marginalized, um, and that's oftentimes what the criminal justice system does: is that it marginalizes people, right, and says, "Oh, they are other, and we are going to put them in prison, or we're going to deport them, uh, we are going to uh, otherize them," as I like to say. And so, I. In the work that I get to do, um, I get to actually spend my days working uh, in the criminal justice system uh, with amazing folks like the people we've just been recognizing um, to help the stakeholders in the criminal justice system 
which is essentially all of us, really uh, be paying attention to what it is we're doing, how we are wielding the power of our government and the, our collective power uh, in uh, the way that we create the communities that we all inhabit. Um, and I get to do that um, by defending people who are accused of crime and helping the folks who are defending them, generally public defenders, um, really uh, uphold their constitutional rights and their right to due process which is, of course, everyone's constitutional rights. And it's important to keep in mind um, that, that people are not criminals. People are people who have been potentially convicted or accused of criminal activity, right? And we are all, um, <clears throat> people are so much more than the worst thing that they have ever done. It doesn't really matter what you've done, right? You may have done things for which you have to be held accountable, and for which we collectively have to hold you accountable, but you are still a human being that deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. <clears throat> and so I, um, I am so honored that I have the, uh, I get to do that every day. Um, and the public defenders here in Washington State are right up there with all of our other amazing uh, public officials. Uh, with our governor, who we all know has come out and has been leading uh, around the country, uh, has been leading the resistance, and the Office of Attorney General, who has been doing the same thing. And for Many of you uh, who may not know this, our Supreme Court Justice, uh, our Chief Justice, uh, Mary Fairhurst, uh, was the second Chief Justice around the company to write a letter to the Department of Homeland Security and say, what are you doing? You are interfering with people's access to the courts, and that is undermining not only the court's missions, but our democracy. So she stepped right out there after the California Supreme Court Justice, um, and in that tradition, uh, way before President Trump, uh, the public defenders in Washington state realized that in order to really effectively represent people who were being accused of crimes, if they were immigrants, they needed the resources to do that. They came to me when I was at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and said, hey, we're doing all this great advocacy and getting people um, really, uh, we're doing justice, we're helping them get plea negotiations or we're helping them win at trial and we get these great deals that we negotiate with the prosecutors for our clients and then they're getting deported right and that's in most cases that's way more way more impactful than having to serve three months in jail or even three years in jail or in many cases even 20 years in jail right people would rather serve that time in jail than they would get deported um, in most cases so that's a little bit about the work that I get to do, and I get to do it with um, some pretty incredible people, some of who are in the room today. So when they asked me to speak up here, they said, okay, you know, Noah's going to come and he's going to talk about the litigation work that, um, that, that they've been doing at the Attorney General's office, and Jorge's going to talk about the litigation that's been happening at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. And so we would like you to talk about why it matters. <laughs> I said, okay, um, well, so I'm gonna try and talk briefly about that short topic, um, about why it matters, and I am, um, bear with me here as I try and, um, okay, let's see here. Oh. There we go. Um, Okay, so I'm going to try and touch a little bit about why it matters, and um, then uh, I'm going to do a little bit of performance art to end this before we ship in, shift into questions, because, um, uh, well, it's really great that uh, I'm really appreciative that people aren't telling lawyer jokes nearly as much as they were a year ago this time. Um, I also like to think about that, just to make sure that people know that like, we all aren't just these policy wonks. We actually have, uh, we actually do lots of other cool things like, um, like poetry and performance art, which you all are gonna help me with here tonight. Okay, but before we do that, I want to, um, I like to actually start out talks that I do uh, like this, giving a snapshot so we can actually see who these communities are that we're talking about. Um, and one of the important things I'd like to really emphasize is that, you know, there really aren't things known as immigrant communities. 
it's important to talk about them like that as we, you know, in terms of to talk about these communities in a way that helps to coalesce and cohere. But the immigrant communities are us. Right? They don't live in some special little enclave at the end of the street. They're integrated in our communities, in the places where we live, and the schools where our kids attend, and the churches where we go, and the grocery stores. So immigrant communities are not something in the abstract. They are, they are us, right? They're all here. So um, that said, this is going to give a face of the immigrants who live uh, and are among us here in Washington and who are our neighbors uh, and our friends and our family members. Um, so these are some statistics that are starting to get a little bit dated because many of them uh, were, these are from the 2010 census, so um, you can bump them up uh, here, but I'm, it'll give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Um, so. One in every four people was either born outside the United States or who has parents who were born outside the United States. Um, <clears throat> the foreign-born population in 2010 was 40 million people. And one of the statistics that, uh, that I like to point out that is often surprising to people um, is that three-quarters of these people, uh, of uh, foreign-born people, are... Uh, <clears throat> Are legal immigrants. So this giant undocumented population that we keep talking about um, is actually only a quarter of the foreign-born population. <clears throat> Here's what it looks like in Washington. Right? So our largest, uh, the largest region of the world uh, from which people come here to Washington, 40%, is from Asia. Uh, Asia and Latin America uh, together make up, as you can see, uh, uh, about 70%. Math is not my forte, but I think that comes out at about 70%. Um, <clears throat> and here, uh, I really like looking at these statistics. Um, here's a little snapshot around Washington. Of um, We have uh, in King County, one in every five people are foreign born. Um, <clears throat> throughout this state, uh, the percentage is uh, pushing up toward 15% of the people in Washington uh, are foreign-born. What I think is really important here is that the foreign-born population uh, in Washington say, state, you can see uh, what matters most are the mixed status families. So when we are talking about the impact and what we're talking about these policies and what happens uh, to people who are deported and to those 1,500 people, um, nearly 1,600 people now, that are spending the night tonight in the detention center, the vast majority of them are connected they are part of a family, likely a mixed status family. Um, they likely have US citizen uh, children. They oftentimes will have US citizen or uh, lawful permanent resident spouses um, who, are <clears throat> who are not with them tonight. Um, so I'm gonna actually um, quickly go through some of my slides because <clears throat> despite the fact that, <clears throat> pardon me, that Jorge and I have been in uh, two meetings together this week. Um, we actually didn't have time to sit down and coordinate like, hey, what are you gonna talk about tonight? What are you gonna talk about tonight? So, <clears throat> so um, there are a few things that, are <clears throat> that Jorge's already touched on that I'll move through quickly. Um, but I wanted to actually um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the <clears throat> comprehensive immigration reform legislation that you no doubt heard about. Um, I was appreciating that Noah was talking about how complicated immigration law is uh, for someone who is a smarty pants lawyer like he is. And I can tell you I've been practicing immigration law for 25 years and it still doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> it is that complicated. Mostly it's complicated because it doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, someone once told me, a lawyer told me a couple of years ago, it's like, wow, immigration law is more complicated than the tax code. Um, and the Congress has been trying to get its head around uh, amending the immigration statute for a long time. Uh, we're actually hoping that it doesn't happen in the current uh, term uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and the one of the uh, things that I think is really important when we, I was thinking about why this matters and what we hear oftentimes uh, is uh, the way that we use language around this and particularly uh, hearing about the 
terms that we use for immigrant communities and for people who have lawful status and people who do not. And I, um, this is one of my favorite clips uh, from a reporter, a Latina reporter Maria Inejosa, who is one of the most accomplished Latina journalists in the United States. And she was appearing on Fox News and they were talking about the immigration uh, situation here. And I am gonna try and see if I can do this from here. Is this gonna work? Okay, so let's try it this way. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Maria uh, gives us, actually she gives the Fox News reporter. It uh, is most unfair though to legal immigrants to allow Ill Okay, uh, let's see here. Hmm. Give me just a second here. I promise this is worth. Uh, promise this is worth waiting for. No worries. Illegals to hop in front of them and. Ch I always take some small comfort when it's not me who's having the technological fall down. Is it, do we know how to get this up here? Is that, is that what? Hmm. Looking for the tech folks who were helping us set this up here. Of course, it went just fine. <clears throat> well, how about we do this? Um, I can see it on my screen. Sadly, you can't see it on your screen there. Um, and so um, I think you can actually, uh, it's Maria Inejosa, and she is on interview with the, this gentleman, uh, this Fox News reporter. So. Uh, it is most unfair, though, to legal immigrants to allow illegals to hop in front of them and cheat the system. And uh, that is what Donald so, Trump, he has given a voice wait, wait, wait a to dispossess. So you, 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 you are on roll there, but uh, so, uh, Maria so wants to get you in. are going to use, I mean, I don't know how, in fact, it was just yesterday, I think, I had to put another Twitter, which is illegals is not a noun. It is not a noun. You cannot well, I, an illegal be, immigrant. I'll use it then as an adjective. An it, illegal it matter, immigrant. Actually, if you're person, here, no, no, no. when you're not you allowed do, to be here, it's you illegal. Can, is that you can say it is an immigrant living illegally or an immigrant living without papers or without documents in this country. But what you cannot do is to label a person illegal. And the reason why I say this is not because I learned it from some radical Latino or Latina studies professor when I was a college student. I learned it from Elie Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust, who said, you know what? The first thing they did was that they declared the Jews to be an illegal people. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about at this point. This is real fear. When I was looking you know, at the numbers in no, terms I, I, of the, you know in, in terms of the, yeah. the early voting, what about those families who are in the states that are going to go for Trump? And yeah. there will be. What about those families? And again, as Jose Antonio Vargas just said, we're not going anywhere. So you have to tell us what that feels like to allow people living in fear in our United States and of America. Cortez so one of the reasons I think all of this matters is because language matters, as Marie Inejosa said. It matters the words that we use um, <clears throat> are important here. And so uh, sorry for the little technological glitch there. Let's see if we can, um, if we can actually, okay, we're gonna continue to have technological problems here, so. <clears throat> Okay, the screen doesn't doesn't like doesn't like me here. Uh, so uh, I don't think that any of this technology up here is liking me at the moment. <clears throat> okay, but help is arriving. So um, what I had been hoping to talk with you about. Uh, 
again, is uh, actually uh, just a few more uh, what I think are important points that kind of build on uh, what we've already been talking about here tonight. Um, and wanting to give you some specific contrast to the Obama administration and the Trump administration. But while we're working on this, I think actually the thing that would be really great to talk about here uh, at this point would be to talk about the efforts of sanctuary, what are so-called sanctuary jurisdictions and sanctuary cities. Uh, and I have had uh, the privilege of actually getting to work with lots of communities around the state that are grappling uh, with trying to understand what a sanctuary city or a sanctuary jurisdiction is and how to actually give it teeth. Because passing a resolution or designating uh, uh, <clears throat> designating oneself uh, to be a sanctuary jurisdiction doesn't actually, um, doesn't actually mean anything. In order to do that, you actually have to change the laws and the policies in the places where you are. You have to pass ordinances or you have to direct the agencies to change policies and how they do business. That's what actually works. Uh, and it, the local governments can't actually give what we call sanctuary. They can't prevent ICE from coming in and actually apprehending people. What they can do is they can actually look to take their power, the power of their local government, and actually put policies and ordinances in place that ensure that they are not collaborating with immigration agents to apprehend and deport people from their communities. Um, in particular, this is oftentimes um, with regard to law enforcement and the intermingling between polices, police officers and sheriffs and the jails. Uh, that is the primary pipeline for how people uh, get into the deportation system. Um, and so what these local jurisdictions, uh, including in Port Townsend, uh, in King County, uh, in many of the cities in King County, in cities in Snohomish, in Yacht in Spokane, the communities are really grappling with how they can take a stand and help offer some offer significant protections to their communities. And as I'm sure you are all well aware, it's very controversial, um, and it's something that we're all going to be continuing to grapple with. What I would like to highlight in here is that the energy that was generated uh, in the in the the stories that have been told and the actions that were taken back in January and March, that tremendous energy that was happening, uh, that energy needs to be sustained. I mean, we are in, <laughs> we are in for a long, long and difficult road ahead. Um, and so we need to still be continuing to show up at the protests, to step out into our communities, um, to be doing the great work that uh, the folks like Libby, Libby Palmer and Ray Garrido and the folks doing the stuff on the ground, that's it's going to need to happen for as far as we can see into the future. And these fights, these less dramatic uh, fights that are happening on the ground to actually get ordinances and laws and policies in place are, are really kind of building the protections that we can, can meaningfully put in place now. Um, one ordinance, one resolution, sometimes one gathering um, at a time. Uh, and it's not just the local, um, the local governments. What we're seeing also are we're seeing the churches who are stepping up to offer uh, sanctuary to people in the communities. So if you, are, if you are not already doing that, participating in those ways is really uh, deeply meaningful. Um, I'm going to quickly give you a contrast here. Uh, um, so President Obama actually deported more people in his eight years as president um, than George Bush and Bill Clinton combined, um, and he earned, at the end of his first term, uh, he earned the, um, the moniker of deporter-in-chief, um, which really didn't sit well with him. Uh, and so all of that really uh, significant pressure that was coming at him from the ground up, uh, he actually... Um, he actually um, took it meaningfully, as did his administration. Um, and so, as Jorge touched upon, um, they, uh, his administration established what we call enforcement priorities. What they did was they said, okay, we've only got so many resources that we can use to enforce immigration laws and to put people in removal proceedings and try and deport them. So we, these are the priorities that we're, going to, um, that we're going to put forth. We're going to target suspected terrorists, um, people who have been convicted of serious crimes, um, people who just got here, um, and, uh, and 
those were the three categories of people that they were targeting. And of the 11 million undocumented people who are here, only 13% of them fell into that category, those categories. Um, the other significant thing that the Obama administration did, uh, it was part of a move that they were doing not only in the immigration system, uh, but in the entire uh, criminal justice system as well, which was they were uh, beginning to phase out contracting with private prison uh, centers, um, a move that has been wholly reversed under uh, the next administration. Um, I'm not going to touch upon DACA because Jorge did, but I will touch upon um, the uh, deferred action for parental arrivals. Um, the Obama administration tried to not only uh, offer um, uh, protection from deportation and work permits to uh, early childhood arrivals, but also to anyone who was undocumented but was the parent of a United States citizen. There were six million people that would have gotten work permits and would have been uh, able to stay in the United States uh, without fear of deportation. However, um, immediately uh, there was uh, a litigation that was filed in the Southern District of Texas. For those of you who aren't, uh, don't do this kind of federal litigation, um, you may not know this, but um, essentially people who uh, are advocating for uh, immigrant rights and many other things, but particularly people who are advocating for immigrant rights, always like to file their cases in the Western District Court of Washington. And people who are, as we shall say, on the other side, uh, people who are um, anti-immigrant and who are supporting the current policies, um, they always like to file their cases in the Southern District of Texas, which is where this case was filed. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this, uh, the whole program, uh, the litigation uh, against stopping this program was successful. Um, and so that program has not been able to go forward. Um, I will give a shout out to uh, the Attorney General's office and to Noah's office because they actually um, uh, submitted briefs uh, in support of, uh, of this program going forward and uh, against the, the, what was ultimately the litigation that stopped it. Um, <clears throat> so we've touched upon this uh, already, uh, but it's really... Uh, couldn't be more dramatic what's been happening uh, under the Trump administration. Um, they didn't just put in new priorities. The new priorities that they put on uh, make, or that they've put in place, uh, make anyone who comes in contact with an ICE agent uh, subject to being apprehended and deported. Um, anyone who's convicted of any crime is now a target. You could be convicted of shoplifting you could be convicted of disorderly conduct, and you will be an enforcement priority now under the new administration. Um, even beyond that, you uh, will be a priority for the, for the administration, even if you haven't been convicted of the crime. So this is now way beyond what we do even in the criminal justice system. You don't get penalized in the criminal justice system until it's been established beyond a reasonable doubt and here, you're going to face deportation even if you have been uh, arrested for a crime. It's not quite clear how immigration agents are going to tell if you are suspected of committing a crime um, here in Washington State. But that's how wide the dragnet is um, is getting is going to be now. Um, Jorge touched upon the fact uh, this dramatic increase already, um, and. Contrary to what the administration is saying, only 20% of the people who've been apprehended um, do fall in this category of people with serious criminal convictions. Um, as Jorge pointed out, uh, many of those folks with serious criminal convictions still have really profound ties to the United States um, and should be allowed to have due process and have their day in court uh, before an immigration judge. <clears throat> so I'm going to just... Briefly, actually I'm not briefly, I'm just going to skip right through this um, and land here on the sanctuary, um, <clears throat> the sanctuary piece 
uh, here because one of the things that's so interesting um, about the uh, this this whole idea of sanctuary jurisdictions, well, there are a lot of things that are interesting about it, um, and not just the fact that uh, the federal district courts are already uh, taking aim already taking aim at these sections of the executive order as well. Um, some of them have already been blocked uh, in the federal courts as well as the travel ban cases. Um, but one of the things that is really important to point out about the sanctuary cities or the sanctuary jurisdictions battle that is now getting pitched, it's becoming a pitched battle, um, <clears throat> is that it's really based upon some alternative facts. Uh, <laughs> it really is. I'm not making this up. They are alternative facts. Um, in the press conference that um, that Attorney General Sessions did uh, several months back when they really started ramping up uh, the idea of taking aim and cutting funding off of from sanctuary, so-called sanctuary cities, um, you can see in the press conference he's talking, he's really going uh, out of his way to really highlight how these sanctuary cities are these dens of criminality. They have higher crime rates and they're putting all of their community members in jeopardy um, because they're obstructing immigration law and they're violating these immigration laws. Um, and I'm not making this up. You can go on YouTube, you can see his press conference. This is what he said. Um, and actually, as Jorge touched upon, all of those things are not true. Um, the established facts, these aren't just facts that a bunch of researchers um, <clears throat> extrapolated from data. The Immigrant Legal Resource Center actually did a FOIA request and got all of the data from the federal government, ICE's own data. And what they did um, when they uh, did all of, ran all of the numbers and did all of the research on ICE's own data was that they found that sanctuary cities, the locations that were designated uh, sanctuary cities that were not cooperating in immigration enforcement, they had lower crime rates, they had higher community safety, and interestingly, they had higher employment and higher per capita household income. So these are the established facts, and that's the story that they tell. So we've touched upon, and I'm just going to have, say a few more things here uh, before we get to the performance art part of our presentation. Um, so one of the most uh, problematic things that's starting to happen is that ICE is uh, arresting people at the courthouses. Um, so people are showing up for, uh, again, to get their protection orders. People are showing up to file their divorce papers. People are showing up to actually uh, answer uh, uh, criminal charges against them, and ICE is arresting them in the courthouses. Um, Jorge touched upon was one study, uh, there's been another study that's come out showing that domestic violence survivors, um, nearly half of them are now too afraid to access the courts. And this was a national survey from domestic violence uh, providers from around the country. Uh, and it showed that this is the rate of fear uh, that's happening and the impact that it's having. So non-citizens really uh, suffer from having second class rights. Uh, under uh, our the current system in which we live, um, you know, when you get arrested if, uh, by an ICE agent, um, you don't get made aware that you have a right to remain silent. And so, the vast majority of people who are who end up in the detention center uh, and are facing deportation do so because they have given immigration agents the information they need to be deported. Um, and Jorge has already touched upon the right to counsel. Um, <clears throat> And uh, what's happening now also is that the, the due process rights and the right to have a hearing in front of an immigration judge uh, is being dramatically curtailed as well. Um, it already, there already were a number of people who didn't get hearings in front of an immigration judge beforehand, but now the Trump administration um, has been invoking procedures under the immigration laws that allow ICE agents to actually just issue deportation orders to people without giving them hearings in front of an immigration judge, um, which is obviously deeply troubling and is going to be deeply impactful. Um, I think we'll probably have some really interesting question and answer pieces, but again, when I was thinking about why does this matter, um, I thought that 
it might be interesting to do a little performance art because when I started talking to folks and I started talking to them, uh, I started to say, hey, what do you think about reading The New Colossus? And people would look at me and go, The New Colossus? What's that? And uh, <laughs> it turns out The New Colossus is the poem that Emma Lazarus wrote on the Statue of Liberty. And so what I thought would be really great to do uh, here tonight is to actually take a moment and read this, since uh, many folks, I think, uh, haven't probably read it, if not since high school, certainly for a long time. So I have actually planted in the audience uh, people who have agreed to stand up and actually do a collective reading of this. Um, and so for those of you who have agreed to do this, would you stand up now, please? And before we do this, I just would like to, for us to take a moment um, and think about the folks that we've been talking about here tonight um, and the stories that we've heard um, and think about um, who we are. I think we've already have been thinking about it, but this is uh, an attempt to actually land this and get out of our heads with it to the extent that we are and land it in our hearts because I think these words were, uh, as are as true and meaningful to us now as they were when they were written. So I believe that Craig has the first line. Craig, would you like to kick us off here? Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame. With conquering wounds astride from land to land. Here at our sea wash, sunset gates shall stand. A mighty woman with a torch whose flame Is the imprisoned lightning and her name? Mother of exiles, from her beacon hand, flows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air bridged harbor that twin cities frame. He hates his land, your furry pump, cried he. With silent lips, give me your tired, your poor. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. My name is Arielle Spesser. I'm the president of the Pro Bono Lawyers Board of Directors. I'm just going to uh, thank you for all for saying um, how lucky we are, these fabulous speakers. We um, are a little bit over time, so we're not going to do a ton of question and answer, but I would like to take five minutes and just open it up for any of our panelists. Do I have any questions? I have a microphone. Yes, go ahead. I have a question. I'm from Fort Townsend. I attended a meeting about a month ago there at churches. Let's turn it over to the experts. Does anyone want to go first? Well, um, so I'll first say I'm not a federal criminal defense attorney, so this is not legal advice. Um, so I, I, I think there's, I, I know that the folks who are doing, who are talking about uh, engaging in sanctuary are very aware of that. I mean, and the threat or the possibility that there could be a federal uh, criminal prosecution. And I know that a lot of folks who are engaged who are having these conversations are certainly talking to folks um, who know about uh, you know uh, criminal uh, federal criminal law in that area. Uh, I think there's uh, arguments about the fact that if you're doing it openly, 
Uh, I mean, some of those provisions are about you know, harboring, concealing, right? So if you're openly, you know, and that's part of like the civil disobedience is that you're openly, you know, saying like you're not actually like uh, shielding in the sense that uh, you, you're being open about the fact that somebody's in your, in your, in your uh, house of worship. The idea of sanctuary is not that immigration legally can't go into a place and detain somebody. Uh, and the efforts that have been made in a lot of places have been very open, where somebody seeks shelter in a congregation. I know it's happened already in Denver, Colorado, for example. It's in the local news. And the idea is simply to draw attention and to provide some protection that's more political pressure. I mean, the reality, and I think the, sanctu- this, the, the churches that have talked about being sanctuaries, uh, understand that legally it doesn't mean that ICE can't come into the church. Like, there's nothing legally in their statutes or the Constitution that says that immigration couldn't get a warrant to get somebody in a church. It's just the political reality that that would be politically a big step for immigration to take, uh, violating that, you know, that, that place. Because I think there's a, there's a sense that religious institutions have a special, uh, let's say, moral or, or political uh, uh, protection. Um, and so... I, I, I don't want to say that there's no concern about the federal criminal violations. I think it's something that the churches should definitely talk to people about how to do it and how to protect themselves. Um, but I just want to say that I think a lot of people are, are considering that. And, and, there are, and there are ways that I think you can mitigate the risk of that. Uh, a lot of things in the law are not always clear. And this is one of those areas where, you know, there may not be a clear answer. But a lot of folks also feel that there's a point at which... Um, you know, like there has been, you know, the Underground Railroad was an, you know, illegal act. Uh, a lot of the things that happened in the civil rights movement were illegal things you know, under the law at the time. Um, and a lot of people feel like sometimes you have to engage in conduct that might cross the line of what's legal in order to um, uh, challenge those laws if you're doing it in an open, in an open way. Just a couple of things that I w- was going to uh, add to Jorge's comments are, you know, the uh, again, this comes from back in the 1980s and the Central America, uh, the sanctuary movement back then. And so there's still a lot of good experience that's left, uh, that's held over and being applied now. Um, one of the other pieces about the, about particularly with regard to the churches, is that um, under the immigration policies, uh, in, that are actually still in place. Uh, churches are deemed to be sensitive locations. Um, and it doesn't mean that ICE um, couldn't technically go into the churches and apprehend people, um, as Jorge's talked about, uh, but they, they, they're, um, it's more difficult for them to do that. Uh, and that's another, for them to violate their own policies or have to get beyond their own policies uh, is this other threshold that they are not likely to cross without uh, only in incidental cases. However, I will note that I saw, I think it was in the Washington Post, uh, Jeff Sessions came out, was it yesterday, and said that he's going to now start targeting uh, the elected leaders of sanctuary cities and starting to target them with harboring uh, undocumented people. So uh, I'm not quite sure how he's going to do that. Um, So Dow Constantine and Ed Murray are now going to be targeted by the Justice Department um, uh, in violation of these laws for um, harboring undocumented people. So it's going to get really interesting here really quickly. Thank you so much. We're going to take one more, and as we call the last one, I'm going to um, just quickly make a pitch. If anybody would like to um, donate to our nonprofit organization, there is one last opportunity to do so. Um, our executive director, Shauna Rogers, will be at the table outside the door. So as you leave, if you feel so inclined, no matter how small, it all makes a difference. And just keep in mind, if you like what we're doing for the community, and if you want to help make sure that this continues to happen on this topic, and on other topics that are essential to access to justice, the way to do that is to um, keep our doors open. So let's take one more question, the gentleman down here in the front. It's really a question to, to the speakers, but also one um, maybe just to, to reflect on. What's the meaning of borders these days? This isn't just an American issue. We have an issue, if you look at what's going on in Europe, we have a, a glo- one world with people moving around it for various reasons. And so what is the responsibility of 
those who, uh, who, who people go to because their country is being destroyed for some reason, um, either by, um, by um, military issues or, or violence in various ways or simply by um, climate change. So are there any borders? And how do, how do we deal with that issue? Wow, I'm just gonna say that's a great way to close this tonight, to think about that as we go forward. And um, really, on behalf of myself and others, to say thank you, but I think that's a really, uh, those are some really significant thoughts for us all to take away from here. Because I'm not sure there's an answer to that question. It's a one for us, it's the perfect, in my opinion, perfect way to end the evening. So thank you so much. I don't wanna keep people longer, but I think one, that's a big policy question, and I think people can disagree about the policy question, but I think the fundamental point, especially that us as lawyers need to remember, is that at least we need to follow the laws that we have in deciding who gets in and who doesn't and how we make those decisions, and if we don't do that, uh, I mean, a lot of the letters that we got in our office was about, uh, after, after bringing this case, were about people who felt like there was nothing, nothing was stopping the president from seeming to just do whatever he wanted. And that really, it, it was sort of a scary time for people that they felt like the laws that they thought protected everyone were sort of out the window. And so at least in, in, in implementing whatever it is that the policymakers decide, we need to follow the laws that we have on the books about you know, our constitution and, and our uh, immigration statutes. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not really weighing in on your bigger point, which I think is a, is a good one, but that at the very least, we need to follow the, the, the basic principles that we've all agreed to about how we make those decisions and, and how we implement the laws. So um, hopefully we can at the very least agree on that and do that. All right, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to tackle your point, um, and it's interesting because it, it actually made me remember a question that I got recently where somebody said, well, and, and they were kind of trying to challenge me a little bit and said, you know, well, you know, uh, has there been a, a time period when there's been kind of unrestricted migration? Um, and I said, well, actually, yes, you know, to the U.S., certainly, you know, from the, you know, Mayflower up until the 1888. And, and I think, you know, certain Native American peoples would say that that, that was not a good situation for them. Um, and, 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 you know, we can talk about borders and historical perspective in so many different ways, you know, about, you know, the fact that California and New Mexico and Arizona were part of Mexico, not not that long ago, historically, right? And so borders often shift. Um, and certainly we've seen, you know, if you're a student of European history, like, uh, you know, things like the European Union where now, you know, borders are, you know, very different than they were, you know, 50, 20, 100 years ago. Um, I think that, you know, I, definitely it's a whole different world now, right? And I, and I think that's one of the things that is interesting, especially for folks who come at this from a more conservative uh, and maybe libertarian perspective. Um, you know, so many things now travel across borders, whether it's money, goods, you know, like I order things and they're from all over the world, right? Mostly a lot from China. Um, and, and so, you know, everything moves easily except people. Um, that, that's the one sort of uh, thing that currently gets extremely restricted. And it's interesting because the people who, from an ideological perspective, tend to be the ones who are more about free markets and free movement of other things and l less government regulation. On this issue, they want a lot of government regulation about the flow of people, right? Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm, I understand that like we're not in a situation where we're gonna we're gonna get to a place where there's gonna be a lot of freedom and movement in the short term. Uh, but I do think when people ask me, well, what's like the ideal immigration policy? I say, you know, it's not ultimately about immigration policy. It's about what, you know, things are in the rest of the world. And a lot of the things that we're doing as a country are making things worse. Uh, and you know, uh, I could talk for hours, but I won't. But I'll just say for a minute that, for example, right now, there's been a lot of people that are fleeing Central America because of the violence there. And that violence can be directly traced to some of our own immigration policy where we're deporting people who, who we said, oh, you know, they they're, have criminal convictions, they become members of gangs, frequently they became gang members here, and then we said, okay, we're gonna be tough, we're gonna deport them, and put them in a place where there's even less, you know, stability, less opportunity for them to, uh, um, um, to be supported, and, and so it created this huge problem in places like El Salvador and Honduras, 
that we basically exported. And so then people flee that violence and come here, and then we have to spend money on detention and border patrol and all these things. It's just like a never-ending cycle. Like this, like we've tried this immigration enforcement, and people said, like, well, we need to do more and build the wall. And we built walls. We built, spent billions of dollars on, on, on border patrol, and that hasn't worked. Um, so I think we need to do more to change the to change the situation in some of the countries where uh, people are coming, and um, and that's going to lead to better outcomes. I, we also have this idea that like everybody wants to come to the U.S. and you know. That's not really true. 95% of the people who, who I work with would have been, would love, they liked the place where they were born and they would have been happy, been there, except for the fact that there was violence or ser serious economic not deprivation. Not I can get a better job, but just, you know, really, really struggling uh, to survive. And so, you know, that's what we got to focus on, I think, in the long term. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, the forced migration that we're seeing now where people are having to flee for their lives, you can build all the walls you want, but people are going to get and end up in trucks like we saw in San Antonio and, and take the incredibly dangerous journeys or take a little raft to try to cross the, cross the Mediterranean because if you're desperate enough to survive, any of us would do that, right? Any of us would, would do that step uh, it, because that's the only way that you, you're going to survive. So I think we need to focus on, on those issues um, uh, to make sure that people are safe wherever they are. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night.